Welcome back to Tech Days Online, live in the Microsoft Reactor in London. This is the eighth year that we're doing this, and thousands of you are watching on YouTube and Facebook. We love it, thank you for watching. This year, Tech Days Online is taking place in conjunction with London Tech Week, and Microsoft is premier sponsor. So let's take a look at some of the stuff that Microsoft has been up to over the last couple of days. We're here in the heart of London, kicking off London Tech Week at COGX. Let's go have a look inside. So we've got our first interviewee uh, here today. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Virtual or augmented reality? Augmented reality. Augmented or mixed reality? Augmented. And why is that? Well, I work at Cognitive Scale, and we do augmented intelligence. So for me, augmented equals everything. <laughs> Have you used an augmented reality app on your phone? Not an app, no. What have you used? Uh, I've used some sort of surgical augmented reality, so you practice doing surgery where you get haptic feedback. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty cool because I wasn't the surgeon and uh, I, they're much safer practicing on dummies than they are on real people. <laughs> Do you remember your first hologram? No, unless you mean the ones that you made a funny scratchy noise and you could wobble them around from a cereal packet. The first hologram I remember was used in Star Wars, and it was uh, Princess Leia saying, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, probably when Tupac Shakur showed up in that one concert years ago. Have you ever used a virtual reality headset? I have, indeed. I created a soundtrack for an organization called Guerrilla Science. It was for a space travel app where you get to travel around planets. So I provided a soundtrack for the moon and for Mars and for Pluto, I believe, yeah. Do you think the future involves wearing some kind of glasses or eyewear? Um, I know that there's quite a lot more hardware coming out like that at the moment. I think it would depend on how easy uh, people will find to integrate it into their daily lives and their daily looks. So I think design is key to something like that. Have you ever done a conference call with Mixed Reality? I haven't, I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I have in my uh, current stroke previous employers. Yes, I have. And it's quite an interesting experience, but it saves a huge amount of time. Uh, and I think it also provides that opportunity to sort of feel as if you're involved in, a, in more than usually a Skype or anything like that. So, yes. Are keyboards going to be redundant anytime soon? You know what? Well, I think the keyboards might change, but I don't think they'll be completely redundant. So maybe they'll be on-screen keyboards rather than physical keyboards, but I can't see it going away, or all those famous last words. Perfect, thank you very much. I still think that we're gonna need some form of way of cueing what we want to say and how we want to say it. Ideally, I think we'll just talk to machines and they'll just type or send the message that we need. I think they'll still be needed, but I'm not sure there'll be as such a heavy reliance as they are today. Do you think virtual reality is just hype? No, because I had my first fully immersive experience with a Microsoft partner the other week, and it was mind-blowing. No, I think that there is a lot of hype, but it's not just hype. It's going to become very important in the, in the very near future, which is why I'm here. When do you think mixed reality might become mainstream? Um, hasn't it already? What does AI mean to you? Well, artificial intelligence is um, really um, talking to robots, but um, is it what just humans put into robots, or is it what robots think for themselves? Who knows? And who knows what will happen in the future? 
So what you just saw in that last clip was our own Emily Bile running around London Tech Week, interviewing a lot of people, trying to find out what they're into, talking to some robots too, which makes me very jealous. So over the past couple of days, we've talked a lot about a lot of various tech topics, but today the focus is all on quantum computing, which both excites and terrifies me. It excites me because I feel like it's the future, and it terrifies me because I can't wrap my brain around the math and the physics. But fortunately, we have a lot of people who will be helping us hopefully wrap our, our brains around that, including someone who you saw in, in the first clip, Dr. Julie Love, who is the director of quantum computing business development at Microsoft. Hi, Julie. How are you? Great. Thanks. How are you? Great. So what does your title mean? What is the director of quantum computing business development? What does that mean? I'm a business leader for Microsoft's quantum program. I work on things like strategy for the program, and I also manage all of our external engagements, customers, partners, developers. Very cool. So walk me through the career path. How does one become the, 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 the director of, of business development for something like quantum computing? So quantum computing is an area that I've actually been in for a long time. Um, back all the way in college, I took my first quantum computing class. It was late 90s, uh, it was before there were quantum computing textbooks, and that piqued my curiosity, and I'd always loved quantum physics. Uh, went on to do uh, particle physics, and switched back and did my PhD in this space uh, with the group at Yale that invented the qubits that some of our competitors are using. But at that point, quantum computing still felt like it was really, really far away, sort of not in the foreseeable future. I went and spent time at McKinsey doing work primarily in the semiconductor sector, I came to Microsoft and did a variety of strategic and operational roles, went to Adobe, ran strategy for their creative business. And along the way, I'd kept this connection with quantum computing. So I'd had the chance to work as an advisor uh, to a couple of quantum computing startups. And so I was thrilled to come back to Microsoft last year and take this job. Amazing. Well, that sounds I, I love that story, and sometime I would actually love to talk to you more about your, your career path. But um, now uh, we're just going to take a quick break, and you're going to talk to us more about, about quantum computing and why it's kind of the future and what it means. So just uh, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in one minute with Julie. Hi, Kim. Um, please could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing here today? Sure. My name is Kim Nilsson. I'm the CEO and founder of Pivigo, the data science hub. And we are here, we are expoing. I am speaking tomorrow at a panel and also we're running a workshop and trying to support companies getting started with data science projects. Perfect. In terms of um, technology that's kind of influenced you in the past five years, what would you say the number one area technology would be? Oh, that's a, a good question. Um, I mean, obviously we're a data science company and so what we're really excited about is machine learning and how we can predict the future with it and all the potential impact that will have on our lives, on how we work, how we stay healthy, how we live, how we have fun. Perfect. And in terms of the next sort of 12 months and going forward, what area of technology are you really looking forward to seeing? Well, I'm very excited about how uh, AI may imp might impact healthcare and how we can actually maybe predict uh, illnesses beforehand or actually speed up diagnosis, speed up um, how we can become healthier individuals. And that's a really important topic. Thanks for joining me for an introduction to quantum computing. I'm Julie Love. to talk about quantum computing. It might seem a little far-fetched, but one could make the argument that the underlying principles, the building blocks for computing, haven't changed that much in the past 4,000 years. Whether it's moving beads on an abacus from left to right to turning transistors on and off, left, right, one, zero, you could argue that these are the same names for the, or different names for the same underlying building blocks. Now, of course, the technology has changed dramatically over this time. Now we can make transistors, automate things, make transistors ever smaller. But these building blocks, these kind of one-to-one -one representation of data, really has remained unchanged. Fast forward to today, where we're on the precipice of quantum computing. And the idea is that we can try out on a single 
piece of hardware, all possible computational paths at once, where we're using very different fundamental building blocks. Those building blocks are built on these strange and magical properties of quantum physics. And it turns out we can use these building blocks to make a much more powerful computer. And these new building blocks fit better, work better, to solve some of these problems that we have that are currently intractable. So the things that I'm going to talk about today are really talk about why quantum computing, talk about why quantum computing is so different from these conventional building blocks. I'll talk about Microsoft's unique and truly scalable approach to building a quantum computer that solves these unsolvable problems. And then I'll touch on learning to program in a new way. And what you'll hear after this is my colleagues Anita and Francis are going to dig more into the, the principles of quantum information and dig deeper into our quantum software. OK, so why quantum computing? Well, despite these massive technology improvements and these conventional building blocks, the journey that we've been on in Moore's Law over the past 50, 60 years, and the seemingly limitless compute power that we have in Azure, some problems remain completely intractable. So many of you will recognize what I have on the screen here. This is an RSA 2048 key. RSA, of course, underlies much of our modern economy. A huge fraction of the web content today is encrypted using RSA protocols. And this is a problem that's very easy for our computers to, to compute in the forward direction. It's very easy for us to multiply. Of course, RSA is multiplication of two large primes. It's very easy to do that in the forward direction. But doing, going in the reverse direction, figuring out which prime numbers were multiplied together is extremely hard. It's so hard, in fact, that classically, and so when we talk in quantum sense, you'll hear us talk about classical computers or conventional architecture. This problem is so hard that classically it would take on average a billion years with our compute power today to figure out which two large prime numbers will, will multiply together. But with quantum computing, when we're using these new building blocks and solving problems in a really different way, this is a problem that with the, the right size quantum computer and critically the right quality of qubits, some, this is a problem that can be solved in 100 seconds. Now, I want to put out a disclaimer at this point in the talk that Microsoft is not looking to be in the business of cracking anyone's RSA. And this is a critical problem that we're actively addressing with our work on post-quantum cryptography or cryptography protocols that will be immune to these quantum attacks running already today on conventional hardware. So let's put some numbers against this. On the screen now, I have a graph showing on the vertical axis, time to factor an n bit number. And on the horizontal axis, number of bits n. And this is a log log plot. And I'll plot my 2048 key right in the middle of this chart. And now I'm showing with, with this first curve, using the classical compute power or conventional compute power that we had in 2003, this is an extrapolated curve showing the time to, uh, time to factor an n bit number as a function of these number of bits n. And if you look up towards the top, what you'll see is that intersection point with my 2048 bit key. It's going to take longer than the lifetime of the universe with the compute power that we had in 2003. Fast forward to today, 2018. We've made dramatic improvements in our compute power. But all that I got in terms of this curve was a shift slightly to the right. Now with quantum computing, we completely changed the curve. We're not only using these new building blocks, we're solving the problem in a totally different way. And I don't get sort of incremental improvements on, on this compute power like I've had. Quantum computing is not about doing what we've been doing with classical architectures faster. It's really about solving problems in a different way. And as you'll see, I get a totally different curve. So with a quantum computer, I clock my computer at a megahertz. I'm now down to solving this problem in a little over a day. So go back to 2003, longer than the lifetime of the universe. Fast forward to 2018, I've brought it back to somewhere over a billion years. And now 
changing the curve using these different building blocks, I'm now down to a little over a day. When we can clock this quantum computer at a gigahertz, I now bring this down into roughly a minute and a half, give or take, which means it's really important. You know, so we're talking about solving these problems in a really different way. We also need to, to address these security, security concerns with RSA, which we're actively doing uh, in Brian Lamacchia's group in, in Microsoft Research. OK, here's another problem as we think about uh, why quantum computing. We're talking about the limits of conventional building blocks. Uh, about a week ago, this was the most powerful computer in the world. This is a computer, a supercomputer located in China, a 93 petaflops. This computer does a good job of simulating the chemical properties of this molecule, caffeine. And arguably, it's a, it's a very important molecule. It powers uh, many of us and many of our organizations. But when these molecules get only slightly more complicated, like this one shown here, this is an iron molybdenum complex. It's just a little bit bigger than caffeine. I can still easily write it down. And you'll start to notice uh, a slight difference in this molecule. It's iron molybdenum, so you'll see iron atoms in there. So it's a little bit bigger, and it's got metals in it. For this super powerful computer, using these conventional building blocks, it would take this computer longer than the lifetime of the universe to simulate the chemical properties of this molecule. And many larger molecules are completely out of reach for, our, for an understanding based on, based on computation using these conventional building blocks. And the idea is now that we can use the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics to solve these unsolvable problems. You know, chemistry is a problem that scales very poorly on these classical machines, but scales very well on the quantum machines. So why is this? Well, it turns out that nature computes using quantum physics. And in order to understand even really simple problems, like why is this leaf green, we need to understand quantum mechanics. And uh, it was this idea that was posed in, in the 80s by a group of physicists, including Feynman, with this frustration of being able to, in the limits of, quanti uh, the limits of conventional compute, which we're already seeing then, uh, there was this frustration that we'd be unable to simulate these complex quantum mechanical effects in these molecules. And, and Feynman and others had this idea to really flip the problem on its head and to say, can we use the quantum computing that nature is already doing, these quantum mechanical effects that are going on all around us in nature, in our bodies, in these chemical reactions, can we use those to do the compute for us? And thus the idea of quantum computing was born. So now we want to talk about a few more application areas that we're super excited about here at Microsoft and that where we see high potential for quantum acceleration. The first problem is nitrogen fixation. And really, I could rephrase this problem as a problem of solving world hunger. To create artificial fertilizer, we have to, to solve this hard problem of, of fixing nitrogen into the soil. And the way that we do that at the industrial level is we take nitrogen from the air and convert it into ammonia. And what makes that hard is that nitrogen in the atmosphere is two nitrogen atoms bonded together with a triple covalent bond. That bond is hard to break. And the way that we do this, this translation from nitrogen into ammonia is we use this very expensive process. It was developed in Germany in the early 1900s called the Haber-Bosch process. And this Haber-Bosch process breaks that triple bond and converts nitrogen into ammonia, high temperature, high pressure, and it consumes about 3% of the world's natural gas. But we know that nature can do this much more efficiently. So if you have any gardeners in your life, or we're just thinking about before we had artificial fertilizer and farmers did crop rotation, and they would rotate, specifically they would rotate the beans through. And beans have this great property of fixing nitrogen into the soil. And the way that that works is that there's a bacteria that lives in the roots of the bean plants. And that bacteria creates an enzyme called nitrogenase. And nitrogenase can slice through that triple bond. 
But we can't understand that molecule. We don't have the compute power to understand it. Because at the heart of that nitrogenase molecule is that iron molybdenum complex I showed you a couple of slides ago. It's completely out of the reach of conventional compute. Okay, next. That was a catalysis problem. The next problem I have on the slide is also a catalysis problem. Uh, this is the problem of carbon capture. And the idea would be that we would use a quantum computer to design a new catalyst that could take carbon out of the atmosphere. And if we could do that, we could start to, to mitigate, if, if not reverse, global warming. So those two problems are in the area of, of simulating chemicals. Uh, the next problem is, is closely related in the material science space. It's long been the dream of physicists and material scientists to create a, a material that would superconduct at room temperature. Now imagine you could have electrons zipping by near the speed of light with no losses in the materials. And to put that in context, today we lose about 15% of all electricity generated in, just through losses in the materials, losses in the grids. So imagine what the possibilities would be if we had a material uh, that would superconduct at room temperature. You could have lossless power grids, uh, new composite materials, better batteries. The possibilities are endless. Next, machine learning. We know from, from research and in quantum information and machine learning that large quantum models can train exponentially faster on quantum data. And we're hoping that that holds true when we train them on classical data. And one of the dreams for quantum machine learning is that we could train faster to higher accuracy with less data. Another application area that I'm super excited about is solving hard optimization problems. So these would be problems where there are lots of different routes that could be taken, but also lots of constraints that need to be met. Think traffic optimization, job scheduling, route planning. These show up all over the place. And these problems, because of all these routes and because of the constraints that need to be met, they explode computationally, making them really hard to solve. One method that we have for solving these problems is to map them into an energy landscape. And I've got a very simple energy landscape shown here. And you can take, for example, a traffic optimization problem. Uh, a high energy solution to a traffic optimization would be to, say, have a major metropolitan area and have everybody leave work at 5.30 and take the major highways. A lower energy solution would be to have people start to take surface streets, leave at different times. But of course, there's constraints that need to be met. And what makes these problems really hard to solve is that it's easy to get stuck in a local minima or a local optima. You can see that on the slide, maybe one of these light blue areas. It's hard to know that you're in a local optima when you're solving these problems. And it's very, very difficult to find that global minima. In this, this could be a multi-dimensional uh, energy landscape. And the way that people who are experts in solving this are doing that today, because it's a completely unsolvable problem, uh, they're using intuition, and they're using years of expertise. And what we found with this, with this area is that just by learning how we would solve this on a quantum computer gave us insights that we can bring back to conventional architectures today. And so it turns out that quantum particles, when they, they sit in one of these local optima, they can tunnel through the barrier and, and reach a, a, better, a better solution, a good enough solution, or sometimes even the global solution much more quickly than we can do on conventional architecture. And we can map that quantum solution back to conventional architecture. And it runs more slowly than it would on a quantum computer. But in some cases, it can dramatically outperform prior conventional best in class. Uh, we had one problem that we were working on with a customer where we were able to solve it 4,000 times faster than they could do on their supercomputer with a single Intel core. And what's great about this is it gives us this nice roadmap to quantum computing where we can solve it today using conventional computers. We can use specialty classical architectures to accelerate things like GPUs and FPGAs, and then accelerate again when quantum hardware becomes available at scale. 
So we talk about this in terms of as a quantum-inspired solution today with quantum answers tomorrow. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about why quantum computing is so different. Why are we able to solve these unsolvable problems using these new building blocks? We're going to talk about classical bits versus quantum bits. But to start out, I, wanted, I thought I'd give a little bit of intuition behind the weird science that underlies this architecture. When I started studying physics, I loved the way that you could use a set of equations and get really bold insights about the way that the world worked. And I was also an experimentalist, and so we would go build these things in the labs. And I remember being amazed with this idea of a resonance frequency. The idea that an opera singer could shatter a glass using a, by singing a single note. And of course, when I learned more physics, I learned that it was about the wavelength of the sound and, and the energy contained there. And if the distance between, between the, those, those peaks and valleys of the sound or the squishing and squashing of air, if the distance between those is equivalent to the physical dimensions of the glass, then that energy from the sound can be transferred into the glass and shatter the glass. And so this is this idea of a resonance phenomenon. Light also travels as waves, of course. Maxwell discovered this in the 1850s and, and reunified electricity and magnetism and taught us that light is a wave of electric and magnetic fields propagating through space at the speed of light. The light also has an alter ego. It can travel like a wave or in certain experimental situations like a quantized packet of information. And you can get these discrete energy levels of light, something that we call quanta, which is the name that, behind quantum mechanics. And Einstein figured this out over 100 years ago, that light is both a particle and a wave at the same time. And depending on when you learned chemistry, you may have learned this sort of cartoon picture of the atom. This is what I learned. With this centralized nucleus and, and electrons uh, whizzing around like planets in a solar system. Now, of course, we know that this is a pretty simplistic picture of chemistry. And we owe, it, we owe our modern understanding of, of chemistry to this guy. So this is de Broglie. Uh, his name suggests that his parents might have been a little indecisive. Uh, but de Broglie was a PhD student in France. And his supervisor was Langevin. And he'd, he'd been at university for some time and hadn't really done much. And he had the reputation of actually being quite lazy. And his supervisor, in an attempt to get rid of him, uh, finally went to him and said, it's time to write your thesis. Uh, and just so you know, Einstein's going to be on your thesis committee. And he figured this was a sure way to get de Broglie booted out and, and to have him out of his hair. And so de Broglie thought about it. And given that his uh, thesis was going to be reviewed by Einstein, he thought he'd better read up on what Einstein had been up to lately. And so, of course, he dug into this uh, work that Einstein had, just, had done uh, on the particle wave duality of light. And he started to wonder if maybe nature was symmetric, if matter, which was, of course, known to be a particle, also had this wave-like characteristic. And so this is what he proposed in his thesis. And it turns out he was right. He, his PhD was awarded in 1924. This was experimentally demonstrated in 1927. And he won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1929. Uh, super humbling for those of us uh, who have a PhD and will never win a Nobel Prize. And so this is the modern view of electron orbital structure. And we start to understand what it means for particles to have this wave-like property. So what I'm showing now is a computer simulation of the vibrational modes of electrons in the hydrogen atom. And just like the glass that was shattered by the opera singer's voice, the glass had a particular resonance frequency, and there were some modes in which it will wobble around. And it turns out that electrons having this wave-like character also have these resonance frequencies. And these correspond to different orbital structures these energy levels in the atom. 
The bright lobes that you see on the screen are where we have a high probability to measure an electron, and the dark, uh, dark areas are where we have a low probability to measure an electron. And it's really this wave-like character of quantum objects like electrons that enables them to encode and process information in ways that are radically different from these conventional building blocks that we started with. In, and in today's classical computers where we use transistors and switches. Okay, so going back to our, this conventional architecture, a large part of economy, of course, today is driven by computers. If you lift the head, you see transistors. And the, what these transistors are are little switches. They switch on and off, and we map those to ones and zeros. And of course, this is binary. Quantum bits, or qubits, on the other hand, uh, they can encode information by, we can have these bits because of their wave-like character. These bits can be in a superposition state of zero and one at the same time. And the real power of processing information using waves comes when we allow these waves to interfere. And so uh, if any of you have been on a, at a, a still pond and thrown a rock into the water, you notice a wave would ripple out. If you throw two rocks in at the same time, you'll get two waves rippling out. And in some places, you'll get constructive interference where the waves will add together and the amplitude will get bigger. And we'll have places where there's deconstructive interference where the wave goes away. And it's really this addition and subtraction of waves depending on the relative phase that gives us this compute power. And the real power, the massive parallelism that we get comes when we allow multiple waves to interfere. Good quantum algorithms use this interference in such a way that the answer emerges from the constructive interference and all the wrong answers disappear. So this encoding of information in a wave using amplitude and phase that produces a particular outcome. Computing with this wave-like nature means that we need far fewer resources than with classical information. And there's certain types of problems for which quantum is exponentially more powerful. So what I have shown here is on the right, I have a quantum register of four qubits. Again, each one of these can be zero and one at the same time. Uh, with a register of four classical or conventional bits, uh, this register could be in any one of 16 combinations. With my quantum register, I can put the register in a linear superposition of all of these states at the same time. In order to capture, if I wanted to simulate the compute power that's held in those four quantum bits, I would need a copy of that register for each one of those combinations. So I'd need the number of bits on the left. This is where I get this exponential scaling. Every time I add a bit to the register on the right, I double the number of bits on the left. So we can put some numbers against that. You may be familiar with this parable of the chessboard and the grains of rice, where I you know, put one grain of rice on the first square and I double it for every other square. Well, I can't show you very much of the chessboard, but because by the, by the time I get to the last square, I have more than 10 to the 19 grains of rice. So what do the numbers look like for qubits? Well, when I have 30 qubits, if I wanted to simulate them classically, I would need 16 gigs of RAM. I can run that through our simulator. I'm running it on my everyday laptop. When I go from 30 to 40, the scales less two to the n. I have a doubling every time I add a qubit. So when I go from 30 to 40, I go from a 16 gigabyte workload to a 16 terabyte workload. When I get to 50 qubits, I'm nearing the limits of classical compute. I'm at a 16 petabyte workload. And the fun fact that I like to use here is if I had 260 quantum bits and I wanted to simulate that classically, I would need a computer that had more atoms than there, that there had more bits than there are atoms in the known visible universe. This is where quantum computing is truly a paradigm shift. We're looking at solving problems that classical computers would never be able to solve. So Microsoft is building a quantum computer. I think about our strategy for quantum in, in three main pillars. The first is that we believe that we have the only scalable quantum solution. 
At the heart of the solution is brand new building blocks built on a topological phase of matter that we've discovered here. We call this our topological qubit. This approach gives us much lower error rates than competing architectures, allowing us to do two to three orders of magnitude more computations before we lose the quantum information. So all of the things that I told you before about these particles behaving as waves and, and being able to have all these magic properties of quantum physics, well, that only works if you don't measure them. So anytime the environment interacts with our qubits, it can measure the system, collapse the state, and destroy the quantum information. And so this error rate, the susceptibility to noise of our qubits is critically important to scalability. But the quantum hardware is not the only hard thing that you need to build a quantum computer. Uh, we keep these qubits in a cryogenic environment to keep them isolated from noise. Uh, our qubits live at about 10 millikelvin, 10 to 15 millikelvin. It's 100 times colder than deep space at the bottom of one of these fridges, as we call them. We also need to build all of the other layers of the stack. We need a powerful computer that can control the quantum bits. We need a scalable software architecture. We need to write the algorithms and the applications to, to harness these magical properties, to hear, all the, the, to hear the right answer from all of the different computational paths at once. Which dovetails into the second pillar. In order to build this, in order to, to realize this dream of a quantum computer, you need a really diverse, dynamic team to build this with, with many different disciplines. And we knew when we started out this program that we would never find experts in all of these areas, experts in the, the topology, the mathematics, the quantum hardware, the quantum theory, chip design, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, the list goes on and on. We would never find this quantum dream team all at our headquarters in Redmond. And so we built a dynamic team uh, leveraging the, the, the most powerful, best thinking coming out of academia and pairing them up with world-class engineering talent to create the quantum dream team. And of course, in order for customers to realize the potential of, of this solution, and just the form factor lends itself well to the data center, this will be seamlessly integrated within Azure to bring these quantum solutions into the real world. So what's required to solve these real problems? So what I'm showing you on the screen now is the inside of one of these dilution refrigerator systems where we house the quantum computer. At the bottom is our cold stage. Uh, this is a powerful machine that can get uh, materials down to these ultra low temperatures near absolute zero. At this cold stage is the quantum hardware. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we have to have this scalable qubit foundation. And this picture starts to give some hints as to why. So you think about bring this massive temperature gradient that we're, over, that we're going through over, this, over just this picture, going from room temperature, which is about 300 Kelvin, uh, down to a four Kelvin stage, all the way down to near absolute zero. And having this scalable qubit foundation, having qubits that have much lower noise, uh, allows us to have a simpler architecture that sits up above, to the extent that it can be called simple. Uh, one of our qubits will be as computationally powerful as 1,000 or 10,000 noisier qubits, which matters in terms of the infrastructure that you need to build at higher levels of, of the stack. We need to have new cryogenic systems that scale as we scale up the qubit systems, the, cri the quantum systems. We need new inventions at this quantum classical interface. We need a really powerful computer that can control and correct the errors on these qubits without heating the system up. We need to develop new platforms for identifying and correcting the errors in the qubits. We need a scalable software stack. This software stack not only has to control the quantum hardware, it's got to control the classical hardware that's controlling the quantum hardware. We need full integration with Azure. We need this computer to be integrated with our customers' data. The quantum computer is going to be a coprocessor to the classical computer, and we've architected it in that way at every level of the stack. And we, we need to develop the algorithms and the real world applications to make this machine useful, to solve these real problems. And as you'll learn later in the course of this show, we have to program this machine in a dramatically different way to harness these magical properties. 
The crux of the air, the crux of kind of the challenge, or one of them, of building a quantum computer is this issue of error correction. So error correction in quantum has to be a lot different than classical error correction. In classical architectures, things that you see here, if we want to send, say, a zero or a one over a noisy bit stream, which we do all the time, TCP IP is a noisy bit stream, we can send redundant information. If I want to send a zero and there's noise in the system, I can send three zeros and someone on the other end can have a decoder and that dramatically suppresses the errors. But it turns out one of the side effects or one of the key properties of, of quantum bits is that you can't copy quantum information. And so this redundancy technique doesn't work. And, and what you need to do to correct the errors is the protocols that we know of today have you use a high overhead of qubits. And the number of qubits that you need is nonlinear with the error rate. So if you had 10, a 10 to the minus 2 error rate, and the, the error rate is within any given time step that you have an error that would destroy the quantum information. If you have a 10 to the minus 2 error rate, you would need 10,000 physical qubits to make a single one, single logical qubit to do computation with. But that exacerbates the engineering challenges as you go up the stack. And so our bet is on a new type of qubit that has dramatically lower error rate that I'm going to talk about next. So here's a single electron spin. Electrons have this property. They can be spin up or spin down. And this electron spin could represent my qubit. Uh, this is a, my information in the qubit is held locally, average direction. And this noise, there's, there's an exception to this. And this is uh, what we have based our qubit technology on. There was an Italian physicist in the 1930s that predicted that you could, you could create a new phase of matter by, by connecting these in a single row and freezing out these degrees of freedom. So just like you see in this train, when I connect the train cars together, I freeze out the motion of, of the intermediate cars, where only the cars at the end are able to have some degrees of freedom and wiggle around a little bit. And this is exactly what we do with this topological approach to quantum computing. Uh, Majorana predicted that you could have a single row of electrons uh, and create this new phase of matter where you fractionalize the electron on each side. And now I've frozen out all of those degrees of freedom in the middle. And so this is the idea. So now I've translated into electrons instead of train cars. Here I'm showing a single row of electrons. I can do just a simple mathematical exercise, and I can, I can split each of these electrons, just a math exercise, into its real and imaginary parts, like this. I can just write that down. And now what we do when we create these Majorana particles in the lab, we apply a certain set of, of fields and, and set up the, just the right experimental conditions where I shift the pairing of these real ima and imaginary parts. I can move these blocks over one. And now what you'll see happens is I have a real part on the left, and I have an imaginary part left over on the right. And these two are the ones that have to pair together. And so effectively, I fractionalize the electron. And the beauty of this is that the information is now no longer stored locally. It's stored in the material itself. When I look at each end of this chain, I don't learn anything about the quantum information. I have to know what's happening at both ends of the chain. I have to bring the ends of the chain together to find the quantum information. And this is what allows us to dramatically suppress the errors. We get orders of magnitude reduction in the error because now I'm encoding the information in a way that's not local and susceptible to local noise, but it's encoded into the, into the material itself. And Michael Friedman, a Fields, Fields Medal winning mathematician, uh, had this idea in around 2000 that we could build a quantum computer out of these Majorana particles, which had never been experimentally observed. And these topological qubits built out of these Majorana particles would deliver orders of magnitude better fidelity. In 2012, we observed this particle for the first time. This is a picture of Leo Cohenhoven in his lab at Delft. And over the past, uh, past few years, since 2012, we've made dramatic improvements in both the engineering and the physics. We reliably reproduce these. These have been reproduced all around the world. And now we're at the stage 
of an engineering problem of, of chaining these Majoranas up to build a qubit. And so the critical piece of this, as you think about quantum computing and the different possible architectures out there, is that all, not all qubits are created equal. So on this chart here, I have error rate. Uh, low error rate is at the top of the graph. Low error rate is what we want versus the number of qubits as we, as we think about scaling out these systems. If you have a higher rate and you scale up the number of qubits, the problem is this goes back to error correction. The compute power, which is shown in the size of the circle, doesn't grow very fast. And that's because I'm consuming a lot of my extra qubits in error correction. And you know, many people are, are, are groups around the world are scaling out noisy qubits and, and focus on this qubit count. But the qubit quality is much more important than the qubit count at this point. Uh, we have these noisy qubits as well. Leo and Charlie have been building these quantum systems at Microsoft, Leo Cohenhaven and Charlie Marcus. We have these noisy qubits and we've decided not to release them because of this, this critical requirement for error correction of high qubit count. And instead, we focused our energy on bringing this error rate down. And so as we bring that error rate down and go from high to low error rate, you can see the compute power of the system already grows. Then when we scale these qubits out, these low error rate qubits, we get this massive exponential scaling. This allows us to save orders of magnitude in terms of, of physical qubits and gives us much better path to scalability. And so it's really these, these three factors, the, the complete end-to-end -end scalable solution, the quantum dream team of people building this and making it a reality, and the connection with Azure gives us what we believe to be the most comprehensive solution to deliver the scalable enterprise-grade quantum, quantum computer first. And this is really the computer that's solving some of these real-world problems that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. And of course, this will all be seamlessly integrated into Azure. So just as we have CPUs with options for acceleration, such as GPUs and FPGAs, quantum will be one of these acceleration options that sits within Azure. OK, how do we get started with this? We got to learn to program these machines in a dramatically different way. Uh, for the rest of this show on quantum, it's going to be all about getting started with Microsoft's quantum development kit. This is our scale solution to help you get started now with quantum programming. Back in December, we released a preview of the quantum development kit, and we introduced Q-Sharp. It's our brand new domain-specific language for programming quantum algorithms. It's completely integrated within Visual Studio. It has quantum-specific programming features, rich quantum debugging tools, and it comes with extensive libraries, samples, and documentation. And it comes with a suite of simulators. And what makes this suite really powerful is that already today, as we're building the quantum hardware and ramping up the number of qubits with these ultra low noise, scalable, powerful qubits, we can use this programming language to write full quantum algorithms for these machines that don't yet exist. And the way that we do this is we test and debug algorithms, small instances of these algorithms on our quantum simulator. Then we use a powerful tool, a tracer, a quantum trace simulator, that can assess the runtime and the resource requirements of these algorithms. So you can know the runtime even before you'd run it on the quantum computer. And you can, we can start to do the algorithmic work to bring the runtime and the resource requirements down, bring down the number of qubits and bring down the runtime. And this allows us to already get started to program a quantum computer. So here's some links to get you started if you want to go ahead and, and download the quantum development kit. It comes with extensive documentation and sample code. Uh, you can learn more by going to our GitHub site and get started in, quant in quantum programming. And up next, you'll hear from my colleagues Anita and Francis, and they'll get, do a deep dive into deeper into quantum information and quantum programming, and they'll dig into this quantum, this quantum development kit in QSharp. 
you know, one slide uh, to leave you with a little bit of, of inspiration as you think about getting started on this quantum journey with us. We know, looking back over history, that new physics always leads to new technologies. The principles of thermodynamics are really what made steam engines possible and ushered in the Industrial Revolution. And that's not to say that the, all of the laws of thermodynamics predated the Industrial Revolution, but that was this underlying physics that enabled this to be possible. Maxwell's equations, unifying electricity and magnetism, describing light and optical radio waves, enabled TV, computers, the internet, the modern world is built on Maxwell's equations. And today we're at this really unique point where we've got this crazy quantum physics that's yet to be fully exploited. These magical properties of, of superposition, of quantum measurement, and this spooky action at a distance called entanglement that's yet to be fully exploited. And as I was learning physics, I'd always wondered what it would have been to be, be alive, be like to be alive during one of these periods of, of massive dramatic change when quantum mechanics was being discovered and we were learning all of these new discoveries. And I truly believe that we're at this point now where we have all of the building blocks in place to go build these systems and realize a quantum computer. We're at one of these super exciting times to be alive and to be in tech. And at Microsoft, we're really, we're, we're a part of this. We're a part of the quantum revolution. And it would be great to have you join us on that journey. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. Um, and uh, we're gonna be coming back in 10 minutes with Francis and Anita, who are going to be going over Q Sharp fundamentals. See you soon. Do you know what a qubit is? So a qubit is a quantum qubit. So it's a kind of like a quantum bit where it can be both one and zero at the same time, or just one and zero like a classical bit would be. Can you explain quantum computing in less than 30 seconds? Yeah, so quantum computing uses qubits to uh, do calculations uh, in computations uh, as opposed to binary uh, bits, which a classical computer would use. Quantum computers use uh, quantum bits, these strange things that can be in multiple states at once that can also do parallel calculations. So something that would take a classical computer a billion years to be done on a computer, uh, quantum computer in about a second. So. What would you do with a quantum computer? Oh, I'd start by breaking a blockchain or two, but then do some, um, you know, some of the horrible computational problems. Uh, the global warming one I do find interesting. Um, uh, tectonic simulation for, um, Oh, what do they even call it, you know, ge geological instabilities and things like that. Uh, probably some social political problems as well, but uh, you know, things of that nature. I would apply it first, I think we've talked a lot about the optimization problems. Uh, and, and there's some tremendous progress that can be done in uh, machine learning algorithm uh, that we are currently using. That's a great question. Uh, probably, um, I was going to say mine bitcoins, but that's a bit shallow. So um, maybe I'll try to solve cancer or, um, yeah, it's very good for optimization problems. So uh, transportation would be good. Um, perhaps energy, trying to optimize uh, uh, batteries, for example, new energy supplies, uh, climate change. You could perhaps optimize and find, come up with solutions for climate change. Um, yeah, healthcare is another great uh, use case. So yeah, any any of the great outstanding problems, basically, I'm I'm actually an optimist that quantum computing can actually help to solve these uh, in in a quite a short time uh, once they come online. How far do you think we are from actually having quantum computers? I'm very confident that we're about five years away. That's variable, as they say. So hopefully within five years, because that would be really nice for studying it. Just ready for going into exactly. uni. Incredible. Schrodinger's cat, dead or alive? Both. Uh, both. Both, neither, and Schrodinger shouldn't be putting cats in boxes to see whether they die or not. And if he had done it, by now the cat would be dead unless it was the oldest cat alive. Uh, nothing but dust. What will quantum computers help us do in the future? Hopefully everything from what they were talking about earlier about um, 
the working out the different um, the properties of particles and optimization problems and machine learning, it could really change the world as we know it. I'd like them to solve um, cancer and healthcare and maybe even aging, like longevity, if we could solve aging and the aging process, because after all, you know, it's a cellular process. So I think quantum computer may be able to help us there. Also genomics. Orbital trajectories are a bit bread and butter these days, but uh, certainly planning for deep space missions and things of that nature, uh, dealing with some of the big data we're getting back from uh, deep space observation, and then, yeah, uh, like large model simulation where the number of variables is just, you know, way outside what a traditional computer can handle. You know, even climate change could be massively impacted uh, through carbon capture, right? We just, we, we talked about it a lot. Uh, all the optimization problems that are pervasive uh, across the industry, uh, and a lot of very, very, very particular uh, machine learning problems can be will be able to be solved when today they cannot with uh, the, the current uh, uh, computing available. What's the worst abuse of quantum mechanics in a movie? The worst abuse. Oh God! Yeah, so many. Uh, maybe Back to the Future, where they kind of go back in time, but it's not really quantum. But um, yeah, any science fiction movie. Um, yeah, some are more accurate than others. I'd have to point the finger at things like uh, Stargate and Star Trek because um, a little bit unlikely. Oh, there's so many because they all do it wrong. Um, I, although I love the Star Trek films, all of their teleportation without discussing any of the ethical implications such as, is it really you after they take your molecules apart and stick them back together again? Despite, especially including the fact that you can't really do that. That's probably a big one for me. talk about quantum computing, it's a completely different game. Quantum computing will enable us to solve problems that currently take longer than the lifetime of the universe in seconds, hours, or days. We completely reconceive the space in which we do computation. Quantum computing is like going from crawling to going to a different planet. It's different. It's only natural that we would want to use the world's most powerful device to combat the world's most challenging problems. We could attack global warming. Security. What are the boundaries of machine learning? Fighting diseases. The possibilities of quantum computers are endless. Microsoft has the best and the brightest working on this problem really happening. Progress is very fast. And we're building a quantum computer. What the world wants to know is what happens when we turn the machine on. What problems will be solvable with a computer that computes in a billion parallel universes at the same time?
Hi, and welcome back to Tech Days Online. Um, we've just had Julie's um, amazing introduction to topological quantum computing and to what Microsoft is doing in the quantum computing space. And now we're here to give a bit more information on quantum computing itself, quantum information theory at a very high, high level, don't worry. Um, and a little bit more introduction to the quantum development kit. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to introduce my, my colleague, uh, Francis, here. Um, I'm Anita. We're both software engineers at Microsoft. Um, and we do a lot of work with the Quantum Development Kit, working with students, getting them started and up and running with the uh, Q-Sharp language and the Development Kit, um, and doing events like this. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's uh, get into the Quantum Computing 101. So as you might have gathered from uh, Judy's talk, quantum mechanics is pretty weird. Um, it's weird because we as kind of classical macro beings, you know, it's, we live in a, in a universe of, of, of cause and effect, you know, where if I threw something at the camera here, it would hit it and have consequences and probably expensive ones at that. Um, but in, in terms of, of, of quantum, um, uh, the, of the quantum universe, this, this isn't the case anymore, you know. It, it's no longer, we no longer have this instant kind of causality. We live in a, um, we would be living in a quantum sense um, in a universe where uh, an observation can randomly collapse uh, a state into, into kind of any one of, of an infinite number of possibilities. So for example, if I was to take this, this glass of water and leave it on a desk in classical kind of land, you know, I'd expect that it would be still there when I came back in 10 minutes. But in a quantum sense, um, it could go into something called a superposition, which is what Julie was kind of uh, talking about earlier, um, of all the different positions in this room that it could possibly have been. And when I come back in and, and observe it and look, it'll collapse down into the one position that I've actually found it, say, over here, or it could be over on the sofas or behind us or, you know, wherever. Now, this is obviously something that doesn't really map very well to our uh, physical universe that we actually live in. So, it, you know, it's quite hard sometimes to wrap your head around it. Even weirder, um, I could leave my, my glass of water down here and shut all of the windows and doors in this place and no one else would be in here. And when I came back, it could actually technically exist outside the room somewhere through something called quantum tunneling. So you get all these really bizarre effects which you don't really expect um, from our kind of classical perspectives. Oh, I'm using the wrong <laughs> computer. <laughs> Um, even more, uh, and, and the kind of pain, I guess, here is, is that we don't actually know why specifically our, our kind of quantum universe works like this. There, there's lots of kind of, of different interpretations that, um, you know, that people have come up with in order to explain these things. So, for example, there's many worlds theorem, which, which kind of uh, says that every time we do one of these observations on, on, a, on a superposed state, um, an infinite number of universes uh, comes into existence almost. Um, which, you know, in each one, there are one of the options. So my glass is over there in one, it's over here in another, and so on and so forth. You also get things like hidden variable theory, where um, there, you know, people theorize that underneath all of this, there is some kind of deterministic um, rules that, that we can actually, you know, predict what's going on in the universe um, with, with, with accuracy. But as you can probably guess, this branches into philosophy quite quickly. Um, and we don't unfortunately have time to get into that just now. So we'll stick to just uh, the basics of quantum computing um, as the Copenhagen interpretation uh, thinks about it, if that makes sense. So as Julie alluded to earlier, um, when we have um, quantum uh, bits, qubits, they aren't restricted to just being in the zero or just the one state like our regular bit. Now, as you can see in the slide here, we, have, we can kind of represent this like a light bulb. Um, the first two that you see are, are classical situations where they're just zero or just one. And the third one is uh, the superposed um, quantum state, which is simultaneously zero and one. And it's, this is the reason why we can, uh, well, we can use this in order to power up our, our kind of quantum computers and get, uh, gain um, in power over our regular classical computers. Let me illustrate this with a quick analogy. So hopefully you're familiar with the fable of Theseus and the Minotaur. If not, long story short, it's a Greek fable, so it does go on for a while. But uh, we have our guy Theseus. He's armed with a sword and a ball of string. 
Um, and he's sent into the middle of uh, this this maze to to kill a minotaur, who's a man-eating monster, half man, half bull kind of a deal. It's Greek mythology, it gets a bit wild. Um, but the idea is he, he ties this, this ball of string to the gate of the labyrinth and then uses that to follow, find his way back out again at the end. So our guy Theseus, he's a classical kind of guy, um, so he's going to have to unfortunately try all of these different combinations um, one by one. That animation did not work, try again. There we go. He's going to have to go through all of these one by one before he actually finds the answer he's looking for, as in before he finds the Minotaur. Now, Unless he's incredibly lucky um, or incredibly unlucky, he's pretty unlikely to find it on the first try or the very last. On average, you'll probably have to go through about half of the options before he stumbles upon the right one. Now, let's pretend that we've shrunk down our, 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 our guy Theseus to the quantum scale. He now, when he enters the labyrinth, enters a superposition of all the different possible um, answers to, to the maze that he, there are. Now, normally, when we measure a superposition like this, we would just get a random result out, which is obviously not very helpful for us. But we can be clever mathematicians and physicists and use the powers of constructive and destructive interference, like Julie was explaining earlier, to actually isolate the right answer, the one we're looking for. So this is you know, pretty powerful stuff. But how do we actually represent this in, in terms of, of, of actual kind of mathematics? Don't worry, it's not going to get too intense, but just the basics. Obviously, in, in, in classical land, as we've been saying, we get zero or one. It's pretty straightforward. It can be one at a time. We can go home and have a cup of tea and not worry about all of this. As you might expect, it's a little bit more complicated um, in, in kind of quantum language. What we see here is actually how we represent a superposition of um, the state of a qubit. So psi, the Greek letter on the right, in the kind of pointy bracket, which is known as a, a ket. It's a Dirac notation if you're interested. Um, this is taken to represent um, our overall qubit state. And this is actually a, just a, a linear combination. It just means we've added up the two states on the right-hand side of the equation um, of our zero and our one state. Now, uh, you might have noticed that a sneaky kind of alpha and beta have kind of popped in there. And these are what's known as probability amplitudes. And we can use these to calculate the actual probability of when we look at this state, wh whether we'll see a 0 or a 1, like so. So what we do is we take a modulus of uh, probability amp amplitude alpha or beta, and we square it. And this will give us the probability of finding either 0 or 1. Obviously, in terms of probability, the chance of finding either 0 or one when we measure it has to equal one because otherwise we've got some other m random states that, that really shouldn't be existing um, when, when, we, when we observe. Now the really cool thing comes when you think about probability amplitudes rather than probabilities. Probabilities, when we think about them classically, are positive numbers, they're, you know, they're fractions or they're percentages or things like that. Now the really cool thing about probability amplitudes is they're not restricted to that. They can be negative, or they can be complex, or they can be entirely imaginary. This is what really enables us to actually interfere states and, and to do this constructive and destructive interference, which I'll illustrate now with a kind of um, a bit of an example, or a thought experiment. So on the slide, you can see we have this, this magic box. And let's pretend that when I put the zero state into this magic box, it gives me this, right? And this is an equal superposition of our zero and one states, meaning that when I measure that, I'm half the time going to see a zero and a half the time, roughly anyway, going to see the one. When I put the one state in, I get this. It's very, very similar. The only thing that is different is you'll see that the probability amplitude is negative a half on the uh, one element. Just to prove that I'm not just making things up, this is the equation that calculates the, the likelihood. So in both states, um, you can see that there's a half, half probability of seeing a 0 or a 1. Now, what happens if I take, both of these or take one of these boxes and glue another one onto the end of it, and then I put my, my same states through? What do we get out the end? Slightly surprisingly, we actually get the same state out. Note that this isn't true for all magic boxes, but this is a particular case that this does work for. The reason that we actually, I mean, this is a bit weird, right? Because when we put 
it through the first time, you get this kind of slightly complicated looking uh, equation. So you don't really expect it to come back out the other end as just a single, you know, what, 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 we, put back, what we put in in the first place. And this is because of interference, which I'll try to illustrate in a, a kind of pictorial way rather than the kind of hard maths bit. So this is our starting state, zero. I apply my magic box the first time. Now you can imagine at each kind of level of this um, diagram, uh, there is an equal probability. So at the top, there's a 100% probability of, of the zero state. On the middle, there's 50-50. So now I apply my box again, and we get this out. So you can see over on that side of the screen um, that, again, the zero is produced a one and a, a zero. And when we put the one in, we see the zero and the minus one. And from this, you can kind of fairly intuitively understand that these can cancel out. Because that probability amplitude is allowed to be negative, they, the, the one states cancel, destructively interfere, and the zero states positively, uh, or constructively interfere and, and amplify one another, which leaves us with just the zero state at the end. Just in case you were interested, this is the actual maths. Um, bear in mind that we don't measure in between these two boxes. Um, that would break everything. So, um, But yeah, as you can see, mathematically, this also works out. You see where the, the plus a half and the minus a half, one cancel each other out. So that's superposition and, and, and the concepts of constructive and destructive interference that we use to such great effect to um, speed up and make more efficient our calculations. What about entanglement? So this is something that Einstein famously referred to as spooky action at a distance. And so it's a slightly odd concept, so I'll kind of illustrate by analogy. But um, let's say that, well, me and Francis are friends. We are, we are obviously friends. Um, and one day we meet up, and we both have a quantum particle in superposition, and we decide to entangle them, So because we're cool like that. Um, so I give uh, Francis one of the entangled pair, and I keep uh, one for myself. And let's pretend in this scenario that I'm an astronaut, because I always wanted to be. So I get shipped off to Mars a week later with Qubit in tow. And because I'm a massive nerd, I get bored a few weeks in and decide that I'll measure it and see what happens and, and see what I get out. Now, when I look at it, I get, let's say, the one state. Now, I know that because my state was still entangled with Francis's when I made this measurement, that hers has simultaneously collapsed down to the corresponding state, in this case, one. And this is, this is kind of bizarre, right? Because I could go to the other side of the universe and do the same measurement, and this would still affect Francis Qubit in the same way. This kind of feels like maybe it's kind of faster than like communication or something like that. Don't worry, it, it, it's not. We haven't broken physics. We still can't travel uh, at the, faster than the speed of light. This isn't a way that we can actually communicate um, over infinite distance with zero kind of time break. Unfortunately, if, if I tried to do something to encode information, like do some operations on my Qubit, um, that would break the entanglement that we have, and, and we wouldn't be able to actually share that information. So these, these qubits haven't communicated like that. But because their um, measurement outcomes are correlated, and I'll show you why in a second mathematically, um, I know that when I've measured, hers also collapses. So it's kind of weird and mind-bending, but really useful for some, um, some things like teleportation, which Francis will go through in a session a bit later on today. And this is not advancing. Ah, there we go. And this is an example of uh, an entangled state. We can tell it's entangled because it's not possible for us to actually generate um, two equations, uh, to sp split this, one equation, sorry, into two brackets. One which describes the first qubit, which is the first number that you see in the little pointy bracket things. Um, and one which only represents the second qubit. So the mathematically, we can't separate them, and, and that's why the measurements are, are correlated. So how do we go about actually you know, producing superposition and entanglement in, in Q sharp? You know, we we want to get kind of down into the code, right? Um, this is actually, so we, we create superposition using that magic box that we were talking about earlier, and this is actually known as the Hadamard gate or the Hadamard operation various representations kind of uh, put up on the slide there. Um, but the, one, the line in the middle is what, what the actual implementation in Q-sharp is like, which Francis will show you in just a second. 
Yeah, so earlier Julie was saying how there's really been a paradigm shift between how we program for classical computers and how we program for quantum computers. So I'm going to demo that shortly for you now, but I just want to say this. Um, classical computers are not going away. We need them for a few certain things, such as the control of the quantum computers, which Julie showed earlier with the um, dilution refrigerator. We've got that cryogenic control, the really the cold bit. Then we also need things to um, prepare our data and to collect the results at the end once we've run something on a quantum computer. And you can think of this in the same way as that with a machine learning algorithm, you run that on a GPU because that certain application is, is better suited for that hardware. But you, don't, you don't send your email on a GPU. In, in the same sense with quantum computing, we're going to have Q sharp code. We're going to run that on a quantum computer only when necessary. So I'm going to switch to a, a demo now. And what I'm going to go through for us here is one of the first um, programs that you can find. So if you go on to the microsoft.com slash quantum site, you'll find resources. And then there's a link to the documentation. And in there, there's the, my first quantum program. And this is what I'm going to go through. So there's the, there's the separation between the classical and the quantum code. And you can see that here on the screen. We've got the driver file. So this is responsible for driving the quantum computer. So in this driver file is going to sit all of the classical code. So you can see that here with the namespace. This is C sharp. So if you're familiar with C sharp or Java, you'll, you'll recognize this. We've got our Bell um, program. So the, the whole point of this program, I should say first, is that we're going to create a superposition um, on a qubit. And then we're going to measure that superposition so that it collapses to either the 0 or 1 state. And I'll come back to that. So we've got the driver class, just as you had, have with classical computing. And then we've got this main function, which is the entry point to the program. And then on line 10 here, this is the first little bit of um, code that's different for quantum computing. Here you'll see we've got using with the quantum simulator. Anita's going to go into more detail about the difference between quantum simulators and quantum hardware. But basically what this does is it gives us something that we can run our code against. So with the Q sharp and the QDK, we can run 30 qubits locally. So I can do that on my machine here. And we can run 40 qubits in the cloud. And if you were to get hold of some quantum hardware now or in the future, you'd just be changing this line here. So there's not much code to change. So I said the, the difference between the classical and the quantum code. This first line here with the result and initials, what we're doing is preparing some data that we're going to feed to our quantum code. So we've got the 0 and the 1 state. And we're going to loop through, through that um, array that we've created. We're going to pass it to the bell test. And this bell test is defined in the Q sharp file, which I'll um, switch to in a moment. We run our simulation with uh, 100 times using those, those values that we've defined. And this, this bit of code here, it doesn't matter if you don't understand the syntax. All this is doing is taking those values out of the result and presenting it to the user. So you're not going to have some sort of quantum UI. It's all going to sit in the, in, on a classical computer reporting that back to you. So now we'll switch over to the Q sharp file. So the nice thing about Q sharp is that you can define your own operations. And so operations are effectively quantum functions. So we've got this first one here. This isn't doing anything particularly interesting. It's just setting the value of our qubit. So we have this desired result. So I'm going to say I want to set it to this 0 state or this 1 state. And we pass it a qubit that we want to set that value to. And then we can go down to our bell test. So as Anita described earlier, the, when we collapse a quantum state, it's going to do that probabilistically because we've got that alpha and that beta. Um, so what we're going to do is pass this count. And this is going to run our bell test, let's say, 100 times, as we saw in the other file. 
And we're going to take an average of that. And so if we run it 100 times and we've got this qubit in a superposition, we're expecting it to collapse down to the zero state roughly 50% of the time, and down to the one state the other 50% of the time. So if we're feeding it 100 as a, as a count, we're expecting a 50-50 split. And then we're going to pass that initial result, which we had defined in that array earlier. So we've got the number of ones. That's just a count variable. Here we have qubits. And this is allocating a qubit. So you've got this idea of a scratch pad. You can create a qubit, and um, you'll be done with it at the end of the program. And the important thing to remember with that is that once you've allocated a qubit, you need to remember to deallocate de it at the end. So what we do is we loop through this count. We set the value of our qubit. And then we're going to measure it. So this M operation, this is a um, quantum operation. And that's going to collapse that state down. And then we're just going to, if we've got a 1, we'll increase our um, counter variable. And then we're reporting that back. So the first thing I'm going to do here is just test that my set function works. Um, it'd be a little bit embarrassing if it didn't. So we've, got, we've just got the set function. I'm going to run that 100 times. So let's see what the output is. So as you can see here on the screen, we've initialized it to 0. We've measured it. And so the state has collapsed down to that 0 state all 100 times, as we'd hope. And again, with the 1 state, it's collapsed down to that 100 times to the 1 state. Now we're going to. Um, do as Anita described before. To get that qubit into a superposition, the halfway state, we apply the Hadamard operation to the qubit. So I've just uncommented that here. And I'm going to run that a 1,000 times. So what we're going to expect to see is roughly 500, 500 for each of those. Now, each time I run this, so we can see here, we've got 496 and 504, 505, 495. I'm going to run that again. And I always forget to look at the numbers when I do this. So 496 and 504. So I've run that again, and they're different. So that's because each time, it's, it's not just using like a random seed and, and doing that each time. It's, it's keeping hold of those quantum states in the background and applying those operations to that. So that was just a really quick example with Bell test. Um, later, I'm going to be going through quantum teleportation, and this gets a little bit more challenging with that. So we're going to switch back to the slides, and Anita's going to go into some more detail about the quantum simulator and a few other things. First of all, I just want to demonstrate how you would actually um, do entanglement in Q Sharp as well while we're at it. Let's do that. Is that up? Uh, it's thinking about <laughs> it. Yeah, there we go. Sweet. OK, so uh, thank you, Francis, for the introduction to kind of quantum programming. Um, Obviously, we talked about superposition earlier. Um, and now I'd just like to quickly introduce how you would actually um, introduce entanglement into uh, your system using Q Sharp as well, because this will come in useful later mm -hmm. when, uh, when Francis is covering teleportation. Now, this is done using something called the controlled not gate. Um, well, in combination with the Hadamard, but we'll just introduce the controlled not gate first. Um, and this basically, it's a fairly straightforward operation when you um, give it a you give it two qubits, one's a control and one's a target qubit. And uh, b based on the state of the first qubit, the control qubit, it will either flip the target qubit um, from one to zero or from zero to one, basically. So if our control qubit, like that, if our control qubit comes in and it's in the zero state, it doesn't matter what state the target qubit is in, it's not going to do anything to the state of the second qubit. 
On the other hand, if our control qubit comes in and it's in state one initially, it will just flip the state of the, cube, the target qubit to whatever the opposite of the one it is in currently. So for example, if it was in the zero state to start with, it would be flipped to one and vice versa. If it was in one, it would be flipped to back to the zero state. Now, this is actually the kind of the, the circuit for entanglement in, in Q-sharp. Um, this is using the Hadamard gate, which puts our control qubit into a superposition of um, both zero and one, as we were talking about earlier. And then what we do is we use that top one on, the, on, on, on here as our control, um, which is now superposed as the control qubit in our controlled not gate. And what that does is it creates this entanglement between the two um, qubits which means that when we measure them, the results are correlated. Which didn't show up, but okay. It's still got here. Sorry. Thank okay, you. so quantum simulators. Now, we've been talking about the QDK and Q sharp. Um, a couple of important things to, to note is that, firstly, um, it's available um, for free, uh, and you can run it on. Linux, Mac, and Windows, which is pretty sweet. And the other thing to note is that actually bundled with the quantum development kit, you'll also find two quantum simulators. Now, these are a little bit different, but both of them are needed to fully test and optimize our quantum algorithms. So we'll start with the full state simulator. Ah, here it is. Um, this is what we saw Frances using in her um, example with the Bell test. So what we do is this is in the classical code. We create our quantum simulator as a new quantum simulator, fairly straightforward. Um, and then we can use it to actually run our, um, our quantum algorithm. Now, the full state quantum simulator um, actually kind of does what it says on the tin. It's, it's actually um, simulating what our quantum particles are, are doing, what our qubits are doing um, throughout those, those operations that make up our algorithm. Now, because of this, it, it's pretty uh, RAM intensive. Um, you can run about 30 qubits, as Francis mentioned, locally, depending on what kind of hardware you have. Um, but you can then get access to more using our Azure cloud service, so kind of 40-ish or so, anyway. Now, the advantage here is that obviously you can you can test to see what results you get out of your your algorithms to see if it you know what you've done actually makes sense um, in terms of what you're trying to do. However, if you want to simulate more than kind of 30 qubits um, locally at least, you're going to be a bit stuck. And this is also not not great because because of these um, uh, optimization problems because you know of the kind of intense um, kind of computation that's required to actually simulate these quantum states. Um, we need to be able, uh, it doesn't actually check sometimes your, your, your physics, for example. Fortunately, there is another simulator which is designed specifically to do that, as well as to uh, solve some optimization problems. You might not have actually noticed the change on the slide. They were quite sneaky and they, uh, they kept the same number of simulators for both, or same number of characters for both simulators. So let's say spot the difference there. This is the full state. And this is what's known as the trace simulator. Now, the trace simulator is really useful when you want to run um, optimization or workloads, as we we're talking about, or also to debug your classical code. Now, it comes with a, a number of different methods, um, which are really useful um, for doing this. The first is the depth counter. Now, depth in a quantum circuit or a quantum algorithm is a measure of the number of time steps that it takes for us to actually uh, do our, um, our, uh, our computation. Um, so count it, you know, being able to count that and, and have, a, have the computer return that during testing is, is a really useful tool when we were actually you know, optimizing and, and trying to minimize the amount of time that it will take for us to actually run our quantum computer, our computation. The second one is the distinct inputs checker. Now this is pretty useful for actually testing our physics. So for example, we were talking about the controlled NOT gate earlier. Now, the full state quantum simulator, you could actually technically put exactly the same. So we start with one qubit as our control, and you could put that identical qubit into the target qubit, which as Julie mentioned before is impossible because you can't clone quantum states. You can't actually make a copy of that. So physically it makes no sense. 
but the full state simulator in order to kind of optimize this, this actual simulation doesn't check that. The trace simulator, on the other hand, will pick that up and it'll shout to you because you're not using distinct inputs. So it's, it's really useful to be able to run both of those when you're actually testing your code. Similarly, the invalidated qubits use checker um, tests to see whether you've actually made use in your code of any qubits that you've already released and you know, are kind of free for allocation by other um, elements of the, the system. The primitive operations counter is another useful one. Um, kind of does what it says on the tin. It counts the number of, of different of, of the operations that you've um, you've used in your algorithm, which is really useful as a measure of complexity for your um, your code. And finally, we come to the width counter, and and this just counts the the number of qubits that you've actually used and have been borrowed um, by your quantum algorithm. Now, one thing I didn't note, and I'll demonstrate in a second, is that the depth counter, um, uh, you can actually set your own gate times, for example. So um, if you know the T gate takes twice as long as any of the other kind of gates in your system, you're able to actually specify that when you're creating the trace simulator in order to actually as accurately as possible um, you know, uh, represent your, your actual hardware that you'll be eventually running this on. So you know, there's a lot of kind of useful factors like that that you can take into account, which again, I'll, I'll show in a second. Now, there's a really good video if you're interested um, in this uh, by Dave Wecker, which yeah. uh, I think Francis is going <laughs> to. Yeah, so he talks about how you can use the tracer to really refine your algorithms and reduce some of the operations that you're using and really speed it up. So I think we have, a, we'll, we'll tweet out a link and you can go and, and watch that because I really recommend it. So he talks about it in the case of quantum chemistry and really just improving that. Borrow this for a second. Yeah. Um, and now we're just going to quickly do a, a demo of um, some of this stuff that we were just talking about in terms of uh, the testing kind of um, in Q sharp. Is it up? Yes. Yeah. It's not on the right. Sorry, it's not on the right screen size. But um, basically what we have here is um, this is available on GitHub if you're interested. Um, we can. We've written a little um, kind of sample for us to be able to, uh, well, to, to enable you to more quickly get up and running with the testing framework in Q Sharp. So if you go over to our uh, GitHub uh, repo here, so we want to go to GitHub slash FR table, yeah. this one, <laughs> slash quantum workshop. And on here, um, we have a bunch of, of kind of samples. So this is actually a really good place if you are interested in kind of getting started with Q Sharp. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of self-driven workshop and tutorial around um, kind of doing this bell test stuff and then working your way all the way up to teleportation. So yeah. um, if you're interested in trying it out, this might be a really good place to start. Um, also included in there is a little section on testing, which is what I'm about to go through. Uh, just here. So, um, so in here we have uh, some teleportation and bell um, kind of code, which Francis will be covering in a bit later. Um, and here is our test project. Now this is actually using um, XUnit, which hopefully you're, you're kind of vaguely familiar with if you've uh, kind of done any coding and, and testing on, on C Sharp and, and kind of .NET application. Um, which is the same framework that's used for testing of um, quantum applications. Um, and I just wanted to highlight quickly the, um, some of the capabilities of the trace simulator. So this is what I meant earlier. When, when we actually create our um, trace simulator, uh, we can set the different gate times. So for example, um, I set measure here to take two times the amount of time than our T gates. Um, and our R gates in comparison are effectively free computationally for us in terms of time, just as an example. So this enables us to really closely tailor our, 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 our tester, our, our simulator even, to our actual hardware. And you can also choose to either turn on or off um, 
any of the checkers and counters that uh, I mentioned earlier. So you can, you know, if you're looking for something specific to test, you can tailor it specifically to that instance. Now, one other thing that I um, was going to mention is that um, with the trace simulator, you're able to actually simulate uh, thousands of qubits rather than the 30 that we're limited to in terms of uh, the full state simulator because when you actually run um, tests using the trace simulator, it's not uh, simulating the full state. What instead it does is relies on you as the developer um, setting a, um, a, giving it the probability when you do any measurements um, of, of the kind of the results that you'll get. So for example, in here we'll see, uh, I've got teleport going on here. Um, Right, and it basically every time you can see here, I've done some, some asserts, and basically every time I do a measurement, um, I tell it that I expect that when I measure in this particular basis, um, I will get a zero. And that tells the simulator kind of what, what to expect in terms of the physics, which is what enables us to do this kind of much, uh, you know, simulations on, on many more qubits. And, and one of the important things for this is that even though we might not have the hardware to run these really big problems on today, you can still take these algorithms, tune them, improve them, and really get to a point where once we do have the hardware, they'll be able to run. So I think um, something that Julie's emphasized uh, in, in talks I've heard from her previously is that this is the major step really is being prepared for when we do have that hardware ready. We can look at these problems now and get them get them to a stage where once we have that hardware we can run them so now we're going to look at the um, blog that we've got so if you go to aka.ms slash quantum adventures you'll find the blog that me and Anita have been writing and so if you start We've got a beginner's guide to quantum computing in Q Sharp, which maybe some of you have read already. And we go into more detail um, in some of the later ones. So the idea here is that we're approaching this from the perspective of um, someone who's new to this kind of whole quantum computing thing. Um, we're trying to come from a slightly friendlier, less maths heavy um, uh, kind of uh, viewpoint. Um, Francis is um, kind of approaching it from more the computer science angle and I'm approaching it more from the kind of physics angle and we're trying to meet in the middle. So if you're looking to get started with all this content, uh, do feel free to head over and uh, hopefully there'll be some useful uh, articles in there. Um, coming up soon will be articles on quantum Fourier transform, on some physical architectures, which we'll go through in a bit later, um, on how to actually build a quantum computer, what physical systems are, are in development, um, and you know what 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 are the main mile, you know blockers in the way of us actually having quantum computers, um, you know, available for for kind of mass market usage. Yeah. So you'll see here we've got the quantum teleportation in Q sharp. That's what I'm going to be going through next in 10 minutes because um, we're going to jump to a break and then we'll be back. So join us shortly and we'll be going through quantum teleportation. Thank Do you, you know what a qubit is? So a qubit is a quantum qubit. So it's a kind of like a quantum bit where it can be both one and zero at the same time or just one and zero like a classical bit would be. Can you explain quantum computing in less than 30 seconds? Yeah, so quantum computing uses qubits to uh, do calculations uh, in computations uh, as opposed to binary uh, bits, which the classical computer would use. Quantum computers use uh, quantum bits, these strange things that can be in multiple states at once, but can also do parallel calculations. So something that would take a classical computer a billion years be done on a computer, uh, quantum computer in about a second. So. What would you do with a quantum computer? Oh, I'd start by breaking a blockchain or two, but then do some, um, you know, some of the horrible computational problems. Uh, the global warming one I do find interesting. Um, a tectonic simulation for um, oh, what do they even call it? You know, ge geological instabilities and things like that. Uh, Probably some social political problems as well, but uh, you know, things of that nature. 
I would apply it first. I think we've talked a lot about the optimization problems, uh, and and there's some tremendous progress that can be done in uh, machine learning algorithm uh, that we are currently using. That's a great question. Uh, probably um, I was going to say mine bitcoins, but that's a bit shallow. So um, maybe I'll try to solve cancer or. Um, yeah, it's very good for optimization problems. So uh, transportation would be good. Um, perhaps energy, trying to optimize uh, uh, batteries, for example, new energy supplies. Uh, climate change, you could perhaps optimize and find, come up with solutions for climate change. Um, yeah, healthcare is another great uh, use case. So yeah, any any of the great outstanding problems, basically. I'm, I'm actually an optimist that quantum computing can actually help to solve these uh, in, in a quite a short time. Uh, once they come online. How far do you think we are from actually having quantum computers? I'm very confident that we're about five years away. That's variable, as they say, so hopefully within five years, because that would be really nice for studying it. Just ready for going into exactly. uni. Incredible. Schrodinger's cat, dead or alive? Both. Uh, both. Both, neither, and Schrodinger shouldn't be putting cats in boxes to see whether they die or not. And if he had done it, by now the cat would be dead unless it was the oldest cat alive. Uh, nothing but dust. What will quantum computers help us do in the future? Hopefully everything from what they were talking about earlier, about um, the working out the different um, the properties of particles and optimization problems and machine learning. It could really change the world as we know it. I'd like them to solve um, cancer and healthcare and maybe even aging, like longevity, if we could solve aging and the aging process, because after all, you know, it's a cellular process. So I think quantum computer may be able to help us there. Also genomics. Yeah. Orbital trajectories are a bit bread and butter these days, but uh, certainly planning for deep space missions and things of that nature, uh, dealing with some of the big data we're getting back from uh, deep space observation. And then, yeah, uh, like large model simulation where the number of variables is just, you know, way outside what a traditional computer can handle. You know, even climate change could be massively impacted uh, through carbon capture, right? We just, we, we talked about it a lot. Uh, all the optimization problems that are pervasive uh, across the industry uh, and a lot of very, very, very particular uh, machine learning problems can be, will be able to be solved when today they cannot with uh, the, the current uh, a computing available. What's the worst abuse of quantum mechanics in a movie? The worst abuse, oh God. Yeah, so many. Uh, maybe Back to the Future, where they kind of go back in time, but it's not really quantum, but um, yeah, any science fiction movie, um, yeah, some are more accurate than others. I'd have to point the finger at things like uh, Stargate and Star Trek, because um, a little bit unlikely. Oh, there's so many, because they all do it wrong. Um, I, although I love the Star Trek films, all of their teleportation without discussing any of the ethical implications, such as, is it really you after they take your molecules apart and stick them back together again? Despite, especially including the fact that you can't really do that. That's probably a big one for me. talk about quantum computing, it's a completely different game. Quantum computing will enable us to solve problems that currently take longer than the lifetime of the universe in seconds, hours, or days. We completely reconceive the space in which we do computation. Quantum computing is like going from crawling to going to a different planet. It's different. It's only natural that we would want to use the world's most powerful device to combat the world's most challenging problems. We could attack global warming. Security. What are the boundaries of machine learning? Fighting diseases. The possibilities of quantum computers are endless. 
Microsoft has the best and the brightest working on this problem. It's really happening. Progress is very fast. We're building a quantum computer. What the world wants to know is what happens when we turn the machine on. What problems will be solvable with a computer that computes in a billion parallel universes at the same time? Hello and welcome back. So now I'm going to be going through quantum teleportation in Q-sharp. Hopefully I'm not going to lose you through this, so I'll, I'll probably go a little bit slower than um, I should do, but that's just to keep you with us. So what we're going to do first is just look at measuring a qubit. We've seen this before with the Bell test. What this was doing was taking this continuous state, this qubit that's in a superposition of alpha and beta, Although it can, it can just be any alpha and beta. In, in the case we saw earlier, it was that halfway position. But here we've just got this general state. And what we're going to do is collapse that down. So we measure it. When we measure that qubit, it's going to collapse either to the zero or the one state. And it's going to do that with probability mod alpha squared. And it's going to collapse to one with probability mod beta squared. And we were able to do this before with the measurement operation, which was taking a qubit and giving us that result of 1 or 0. 
And we can notate this as a circuit diagram. If you've come from a computer science background or maybe electronic engineering, you might recognize symbols like this. So we're going to be looking at a circuit diagram later for quantum teleportation. And so here we've got this M, and we've also got this, uh, I don't know, what, what would you it's call a, that? A little kind of gauge, I guess, okay. a little dial for measuring, <laughs> yeah. like a speedometer, I guess. Um, so I'm going to stick with the M one because it's easier to say. <laughs> then we've got quantum operations. So just with classical computing, you've got these um, gates. So you can have an OR gate, an AND gate, a NOT gate. And we've got quantum equivalents for those, which I'm going to run through now. So we've got the NOT gate. And we really like these light bulb um, graphics, so you, hopefully you won't get too tired of these. We've got the zero. And when we apply the NOT gate to that, it's going to take that to one. And when we've got one, we apply the NOT gate, it's just going to flip it to zero. And for that, we use the X operation. And I think this is a historical note, maybe from classical computing, of like the crossing of the wires, which is why it's an X. But it's just, it's just not and it takes a qubit, and it doesn't give any res a result. It's just operating on that qubit. And we represent this with the X gate, like this. So then we come to CNOT, which we briefly looked at earlier. I'll just go through that again, just in case you um, weren't in the earlier session. So what we've got is, just like with NOT, we've, we've got this qubit, but then we've also got a second qubit. And this first one is the control qubit, and the second one is the target. And when we've got two qubits next to each other like this, we can, we can notate those more easily by like smushing them together. There's, I think there's a must. That's definitely the technical is term, it? smushing them together. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Physics. If someone knows, comment. <laughs> I should really know it by now. But anyway, um, what we're going to do is use the control. And if the control is 1, it will flip the target. If it's 0, it won't. So here we've, the control is zero, so we do nothing to the target. We can just add this to our table here. In the case, again, the control is zero, so nothing's going to happen to that second target qubit. So add that to the table there. In this case, the control qubit is now one, which means we're going to flip that second target qubit. So that takes one naught to one one. And lastly, we've got one, one. The control is one, so we flip that, target, that second target qubit. So that's seen up. And we can use this quite simply in Q sharp with the operation seen up, which takes the control and the target. And again, it, it just operates on that qubit and doesn't return a result, which is why we've got the empty brackets at the end of that line. Now, this is the diagram for that. I think it's probably the, the funkiest the, diagram I've seen for any of the circuit, circuit descriptions. And we've got Z now, and I ran out of light bulbs for these. <laughs> so we've just got zero, and that goes to zero. And what this one does is when it's one, it takes that to negative one. So that's really nice and simple. And again, um, quite intuitive naming. We've just got the operation Z and the Z symbol. And Anita mentioned Hadamard earlier, and I used that in the Bell test example. So what this does is it takes zero qubit, and it puts it into that halfway state. And we can notate that as 1 over root 2 naught plus 1 over root 2 1. And if we apply that same Hadamard operation to the 1 qubit, it's going to put that in, in the same halfway state, but this time it's negative. Again, we've got the operation H and the H circuit symbol. So this is our toolbox, and these are the operations that we're going to use for quantum teleportation. So just to summarize, we've got, <clears throat> we've got NOT, we've got CNOT, Z, and Hadamard. So keep Keep note of those. Maybe you want to screenshot the screen. Uh, we'll come back to those. So you we'll should, them later. Yeah, so. you should be all right. <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly run through entanglement again and go into a bit more of the maths. So to do entanglement, we apply this Hadamard operation to the first qubit. And we can see that using this table here. And so 
when you're reading these circuit diagrams, <clears throat> you need to look at the end and you'll see that once the Hadamard operation, oh, sorry, we, we start with these, the zero and the zero on the far left of the screen. And then we apply that Hadamard operation to the first qubit. Now, if you watch the first qubit carefully, we apply that Hadamard gate to it, as we've seen before. And then we can simply multiply out that bracket. So we get the 1 over root 2 naught naught and the 1 over root 2 1 naught. And at this point, um, as, I mean, as we've just multiplied out a bracket, um, this is not entangled, right? We can still see that we could separate that back out into those two brackets. Yeah. So now the crucial point is that we're going to apply the CNOT gate. And that's where they then, you can't mathematically separate them. So if we look at the table for CNOT, what we're going to do is look at, the, the arrow is pointing to what we had before we applied the CNOT. Now if we apply the CNOT gate to that 0, 0 term, it's not going to do anything. The input for 0, 0 gives an output of 0, 0. However, if we look at the one naught input, if we apply that CNOT gate to that, that's going to give us that output of 1, 1, which we can see there. So that's the result of the entanglement circuit. And that we're going to use later for quantum teleportation. So just as a summary, that's what we see. And that state at the end you'll hopefully recognize as the one that I gave earlier as an example of a state that is mathematically inseparable and therefore we can say it's entangled. And the, you know, when we take a measurement of either one of these qubits, it will therefore affect the state of the other one. It'll mm -hmm. collapse that state down at the same time. Right. So now we can get to quantum teleportation. So first I'm going to give a little motivation of why you want, might want to do this. So again, say I have a qubit and Anita's got a qubit and I want to send some unknown message and we've got this psi symbol here. I don't know what that qubit is, but I'd like to send it to Anita. Now we've got the problem of physically, how do I send that? We're like, we're <laughs> here right now, so but say we were separated over a long distance, we'd have to use communications channels. And at the moment, we don't have those that support quantum teleportation or quantum information. So physically, we can't send it using quantum information. So maybe we could do it classically. Now, the trouble is with these continuous states, if we were to try and write that as a, as a classical a representation of zeros, ones, like continuously, that's going to take a really long time to write out, and I'm, yeah, I'm not going to be able to send that to Anita. So the answer is quantum teleportation, and we're going to go into a bit more depth of how I can use just two bits of information, classical information, to send Anita this unknown quantum state. So the first step we have to do as a step naught, entangle our qubits. So we're going to use that Hadamard and CNOT operation that I've just previously explained. And that was the result that I showed earlier. And I'm going to notate that with this yellow squiggly line. Again, I'm not very good at like the proper definitions and symbols for that, but hopefully you understand what that is. The first step one that we're going to do is entangle my qubit with the state to be sent. So my qubit, that one in, in the middle, and the state to be sent, the one at the top. So we're going to apply the C0 gate and the Hadamard gate. And this message that I'm trying to send, I've said it's unknown, and it's unknown because it's this general alpha and beta. I don't know what those values are. So the, uh, the question is, what, what have we got at this point in the circuit? Now, I could bore you with the maths, um, but I'm not going to because I don't want you to leave the stream. Um, so here's the answer, and it looks pretty ugly. So I'm going to break this down for us now. So we've got this first term. We've got the second term, third term, and fourth term. Now, if we go back to our circuit, 
I want to measure the first two qubits, and this is our step two. So I'm going to measure the message, and I'm also going to measure mine. And again, we're using these circuit symbols that I introduced earlier. And if I measure that state at that point, what we're going to do is we're going to collapse those two qubits down. I'm going to get a single result out. So that measure operation gives us either a 0 or 1, and that's a classical 0 or 1, because it's no longer a quantum state. And so I've now got two bits of information. I've got a 0. I could have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1 as, as those possible combinations for those two qubits. So if we go back to our long maths bit here, say I measured the qubits, the first two qubits, and got 0, 0. So this is the only term that agrees with that. So that means that we know our third qubit, i.e. Anita's qubit, is in this state here. And if we compare that to the message that I was trying to send, we can see that it's the same. So Anita now has that message that I was trying to send, and we don't have to do anything more to that. Now, what about the case if I measured and I got 0 and 1? Well, we now know that this third qubit, Anita's qubit, is in this state because this is the only term that agrees with that. However, if we compare that to what I was trying to send, we can see that it's a little bit different. We've got that alpha 1 plus beta 0 compared to the alpha 0 plus beta 1. And we can apply a not gate like so, and that switches the 0 and the 1. So you can see those now agree. Now if we come to this third term, if we measure and get a 1 and a 0, we know that this third qubit is in this state. And if we compare that to what I was trying to send, you can see that it's got that negative symbol there. And the gate that we can apply is this Z gate, which is going to flip that one to a positive one. And if you need reminding, um, just skip back in, in the slides, and you'll be able to see that. And finally, we've got the last term, which we'll get if we have a measurement of 1, 1 for that, our first two qubits. And now what we need to do to Anita's qubit here is first we're going to apply a Z gate, which makes that to a plus. Then we're going to apply a not gate, which is going to flip that 1 and that not, like so. So just to summarize what we've done there, when we had a measurement of 0, 0, we didn't do anything, because Anita had the message that I was trying to send. When we had 0, 1, we applied that not gate. When we had 1, 0, we applied Z. And when we had 1, 1, we applied not and Z. So this is important. Remember these, because I'll come back to it when we're going through the code. And just one thing to point out. So if you look at the first qubit in the measurement, in the final two lines, we've got 1, 0, and 1, 1. So that first qubit is 1 from both of those. I'll just point this out here. Um, we've got 1 and 1 here. And we're applying a Z and a Z to both of those. And then here, when we've got 1 for the second qubit and 1 for the second qubit here, we're applying this not to both of those. So we actually only need to like, do two um, if statements when it comes to the code, to which gate we apply. And we'll see that later. So this is the full circuit. Now I'm going to jump into a demo and show you how we can do that in Q Sharp. And if you're wanting to follow along, you can go to either my GitHub, which was um, github.com slash frtibble slash quantum you know, workshop. <laughs> you know mine better than I do. have done this before. <laughs> um, or you can go to the Microsoft samples, and you can find the teleportation sample there as well, along with many others. So first, we're going to look at the driver file. Now, this is 
not too interesting, so I'm not going to spend too long on it. If you see again, we've got this idea of the quantum teleportation namespace. That's where all, all of our teleportation code is going to sit. We've got our driver file. And again, we're using the quantum simulator. And the classical code for this is just outputting to the terminal that we're beginning running our teleportation. Then it calls our teleportation um, teleport arbitrary state, which is sitting in the Q sharp file. And that's running using our simulator, and it's feeding that an operation. And then we're just writing another line out to the terminal. So if we go over to the operation Q sharp file, we can look at our teleport operation. So what this is doing is taking the message qubit, that unknown state that I wanted to send, and then it's also got the second parameter is there, so that's Anita's qubit. And what we're going to do is allocate a qubit to a register, and this is what I'm going to use for, for my qubit. And we're just assigning that qubit that we've allocated in that register to this variable here. So that's my qubit that I've got here. So the first step that I talked about, or actually it was step naught, was that we had to entangle our qubits. And so we did that using the Hadamard and the CNOT operation. So we apply that Hadamard um, to my qubit, and then we apply the CNOT gate to my qubit and Anita's to get those entangled. So then now when we're separated over a large distance, when Anita decides she wants to go to Mars, she can, she can send me this, um, well, I can send her a state and say, how are you doing up there? Um, come back. <laughs> um, <laughs> so now we can go to step one. We've got the CNOT operation, so that's the message in here, and the Hadamard, so that's just moving that message um, into that entanglement. And as I summarized before on the, on the board, we said that if we measured that, um, let's just double check that. Uh, where's it gone? If we measure that first qubit, we apply the Z. So that's, that message is that that's my first qubit. So if we measure that to be one, we apply that Z, cube, uh, Z operation to Anita's qubit. And if we measured that second qubit here, oh, sorry, the message, yeah. Uh, if we measure my qubit here to be one, we apply that X operation, the not to Anita's qubit there. And then, as I mentioned before, when we were doing the Bell test, we have to release our qubits because other people might want to use them, and they need to get those qubits in a state that they, that they know what they are. So we reset here before we exit that function. So now we come to teleport arbitrary state. So this is what we're going to use. We're going to use that teleport operation that we've de defined. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some operation and then apply that to the qubit message. So here we've got a register, and we can allocate two qubits to this register. And you'll see the difference um, with this line up here. When we wanted to allocate one qubit, we just had, it, had the one there. Now we've got two here. And we can index that register just like an array. So we've got that first qubit at index 0, and that second qubit at index 1. And so we're we've allocated those qubits for our message in there. Then we apply this, this operation. So this, this is just like, um, like in maths where you've got x or y for variables. We've got this u, so this is whatever operation we, we give it. And then we're going to teleport that message to there. We're going to apply the inverse to so reverse that operation. And then we're going to reset, reset both of those in the register. So if you come back to the driver file, just to remind you, we've got the teleport arbitrary state, and we're applying that hard mod operation. So this is um, not a terribly exciting end to this demo. <laughs> We've just got running teleportation, and it tells us it's running. Um, 
<laughs> but, yeah, um, it has done something in the background. And that's Q sharp for teleportation. So now we're going to go over to Anita, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about how we build quantum computers. Thank you very much. I've got to fix the resolution this time, so hopefully it will be uh, easier for you guys to see. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yep, it is up. Success. Okay, right, we have slides. Um, cool, so thank you very much, Francis. That was uh, an awesome introduction to teleportation. Now, what I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about is actually, and as we, we've kind of discussed, you know, the kinds of things you'd want to do with a quantum computer in terms of, you know, some, some operations and some kind of way we look at coding it, but how do you actually go about building one of these things? Um, I mean, check out the, the the slide behind me there. You know, we're we're going to need some some kind of some smart smart scientists there. Uh, we're going to need some 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 quantum particles, probably some magnets, some stuff to do measurements. Our ruler over there. Going to need a lot of hardware, um, as the dilution refrigerator kind of you know demonstrates. Um, some lasers. We're going to need to cool it down, um, and we're going to need a classical computer to actually control all of this with. So. So how, how do these components, you know, actually all come together? You know, what, what kinds of physical systems are we actually using to represent our, our qubits? And that, that's what I'd like to kind of cover in this particular um, session. Now, um, before we can kind of go into that, it would probably be better to, um, you know, define what exactly it is, um, you know, what criteria must we actually fulfill before we can call a system that we built an actual, you know, successful quantum computer. Um, fortunately for us, uh, this chap back in the 90s called David DiVincenzo, that I, I really hope I pronounced his name correctly. That sounds good. Um, he was a really cool guy. Um, but he came up with this pretty simple five plus two um, methods, which we, uh, sorry, requirements that a system needs to fulfill before we can actually call it that kind of, you know, successful quantum computer. Um, and they're actually pretty, pretty straightforward, as you can see, right? So we'll start um, with easy reset. Now, this one is, is the same in classical as it is in quantum computing. We need to be able to reliably and repeatably reset our qubits into a simple starting state. So for example, like we saw in the, um, in the Bell test, we wanted to set our qubits into the zero state for the start of every operation. Similarly, in an actual physical quantum computer, we're going to want to do the same kind of thing. Otherwise, you know, if you do operations on a qubit that you've no idea what state it started in, it's not going to be hugely helpful for you when you measure the result at the end. Fairly straightforward. I'll skip over stable just for, for a second. I'll go through the other ones first. The next thing that we need to be able to fulfill is measurable. Now, our qubits at the end of the day, we need to be able to actually you know, read out what the state of those qubits are to collapse those superpositions and find our answer. Otherwise, we might as well not have bothered, right? So this is what the kind of the measurable um, requirement means. Universal. So universality is one that got me a bit in, in, in uni. It's kind, of, it's, it's a kind of silly, complicated word for a fairly straightforward uh, concept. Basically, universality is just the requirement that we can break down any complex kind of algorithm or operation that we want to do on our quantum computer into a sequence of kind of basic steps that we're actually physically able to implement. So these are kind of single and, and, and uh, kind of two qubit gates, for example. So you can kind of take this uh, as, as an analogy, right? So if, if I asked you to do five times 10, Obviously, you could, well, I hope you could probably do it in your, in your head fairly quickly. Um, if I did ask you to do five times 1,724.7, it's probably going to take you a little bit more time. But multiplication can really be broken down into a series of fairly easy things to do, like addition, right? So if I asked you the, you know, the five times 10, that's 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. And you can kind of think about universality in a similar way. Um, you know, if, if we're able to break down these hugely complex things that we want to do with a quantum computer into much simpler building blocks, then, you know, we, we can actually say that actually 
yes, this is, this is a fully universal working quantum machine. Awesome. Scalability. Now, um, as, as Julie kind of mentioned earlier, we're going to need um, a lot of qubits in order to do something kind of actually useful with them, right? A single qubit by itself is completely useless to us. Two qubits is a little bit better, but not ideal. Um, she was talking about, uh, sorry, Julie was talking about uh, nitrogenase and, and, and um, synthesis of ammonia for the use in farming um, earlier. And for that, you'd actually need 170 qubits to, to simulate that, that, uh, that molecule. So you can kind of see how, you know, we're, we're going to need to start thinking on a bit of a bigger scale. So if, if we can't actually physically create enough of these qubits, then it's not going to be any use to us in the long run. So it's not really worth pursuing. Now, I said I'd come back to stability. And the reason I want to cover this one off last is because it's actually the main blocker in the way of, of us kind of, you know, coming up with, with working quantum computers, as, as Julie said earlier as well. Um, you know, quantum states are, are really, really susceptible to kind of perturbation, to interaction with the environment at large. Now, be that cosmic rays that just happen to, you know, kind of come in and hit our experiment at that time, or maybe our microscope that we're using to, to do something is, is, is emitting a little bit of electron kind of radiation, or maybe someone jogged the table. It doesn't really matter. Very, very tiny fluctuations, things that we wouldn't notice even remotely on, on the kind of macro scale, can count as an observation, as a measurement on those quantum states and can ruin that nice kind of quantum superposition and entanglement that we actually need to use for our um, computation. So fighting this, this problem, this problem is called decoherence, by the way, is this kind of lack of, you know, is this loss of the, the quantumness <laughs> almost of our qubit. Totally not a word, but it is now. Um, and, and this is really what we're trying to fight with, you know, when, when we're um, building quantum systems at the minute, the real nemesis. Now, I mentioned that there's also two uh, extra uh, requirements, and these are for communication. Now, uh, these are fairly kind of straightforward, um, and they're also both kind of related. So the first one is data transfer. Um, this basically just means that we need to be able to transfer information from one part of our quantum uh, system to another in the same way as you would need to do that for a classical system, because if we can't transfer information, you can only do computation locally, then it's not going to be of any huge use to us um, later on when we scale it up. The second one is kind of related to that in that we need to be able to convert qubits, which are stationary kind of logical qubits, into moving or, or kind of flying, as they're called, flying communications ones. OK, so now we kind of have learned what, you know, what we actually need to do to successfully call a quantum system a quantum computer. Um, I'd like to kind of quickly cover off three different flavors um, which people are working on in various different groups um, around the world. The first one is ion trap quantum computation. Now, this is a <laughs> rather boring looking schematic. It's cool. Um, <laughs> which I, I, I've kind of adapted from Nielsen and Chuang's uh, pretty awesome book, which you should definitely check out if you're interested in this. Um, but basically, it, it, it's just kind of, it, it's, a, it's a diagram of what ions in a trap actually kind of are doing, right? So we, we've got three ions. An ion is just, uh, it's the nucleus of, or it's, sorry, it's, a, it's an atom which has gained or lost an electron or electrons, plural, um, to gain a charge, um, either a positive if it's lost electrons or a, a negative one if it's gained some. So because they're charged, they're pretty easy to manipulate, um, and which is what we see here. This is a trap, an ion trap, funnily enough. It's a trap. Um, <laughs> but uh, what we do is we use lasers, and we use these electromagnetic fields to actually control um, our ions and to cool them down low enough into a state so they're stationary and stable enough that we can use them for computation, which is pretty cool. Now, in reality, that looks rather a lot more exciting. Um, this particular example is actually taken um, from the Oxford Quantum Computing Group who are looking into ion traps uh, for, for computation. Now, if you look really closely in between the two kind of horizontal electrodes there, you'll see a little dot. Now, that dot is actually a strontium ion. Now, you can't normally see that with the naked eye, but what they've done is they've taken this really long exposure shot 
so that over time that effect of the of the fluorescence of the strontium um, ion builds up and you can actually physically see it which is pretty cool like you're looking at an ion there which I, th I think it's pretty cool anyway. Did this win a prize for photography, I think? I think it did actually yeah. win a prize, this, which I can't blame them. That's a yeah. pretty cool picture. Like. Um, and, and we mentioned kind of scalability um, as well earlier. Um, and as you can see at, at the bottom there, that's actually a, a string of nine ions held in a very similar trap. So we've got the kind of, you know, the makings of a, of a system that maybe we can use for, for computation. But how do we actually represent, you know, the, the two states, right? I mean, for a, for a qubit to, to work, we need a state that represents zero and a state that represents one. And in terms of ions, we actually use two different energy levels. Now, energy levels um, are, are, we can manipulate quite easily by pumping energy in the form of light energy, uh, as in a photon. Um, we can, so we've got a lower energy state here on the left-hand side, um, and we introduce a photon, we shoot it at the, the ion, it absorbs the energy from that photon, and gets excited up to the higher level. We can call this our one state. So we've got zero at the ground level and one at the higher level. Similarly, our upper kind of one state can lose a photon or can emit a photon and drop back down to the lower energy state, to our zero state. So we've got a fairly kind of straightforward two state system. Great news. So how does this stack up to our, our criteria that we kind of explored earlier? actually pretty well you know there's, there's a reason that this is being um, you know explored by a number of different groups globally um, it's easy to reset I mean ions are pretty straightforward you know I mean salt is made of ions for example sodium and a chloride ion um, it, they're, they're pretty easy to get hold of because they have a charge they're fairly easy to manipulate as well as we saw with that trap earlier um, and it's universal, so people have actually demonstrated all of the single and double qubit gates that we need to actually, uh, that, that make up something called a universal set, which is the set of, of gates that we need to actually make up all of these more complicated um, operations that we're, we're talking about. Unfortunately, it's not perfect. Um, whilst ions are actually one of the most naturally stable qubits, um, they, they're kind of, they last for the longest. Um, what, what temperatures do they need to be at? What temperatures? Oh, super low temperatures. Like super low, a few, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, so well. We're talking kind of few Kelvin kind oh, of okay. temperatures, so yeah. or probably less. I'm not sure specifically. But, yeah. um, the, the, the problem being that they still, um, they don't quite last long enough for us to reliably be able to do our computation on them. So, for example, if my ion state, obviously this is not the actual time, but if our ion state lasted for five seconds and my computation took 10 seconds, it's not going to be any kind of use because it's going to decohere and be useless to us by the time we actually finish computing. Um, and, and whilst ions are actually relatively stable in comparison to a lot of other types of qubit that are in development, um, it, uh, it's still not quite the level that we need to, uh, to kind of call it, you know, rubber stamp it as a, as a successful system. That obviously then affects the scalability, right? Because uh, one way that physicists work around um, this problem of decoherence is by introducing extra kind of backup qubits almost, and these are used for error correction. So if one of the qubits that we're using for computation uh, loses its quantumness, decoheres, uh, we have qubits that are you know, capable of, of correcting for that and compensating. Um, unfortunately, that rapidly increases, as Julie was saying, the number of uh, qubits that we actually need to produce and maintain, which obviously makes this a much more complicated system and makes it a lot more difficult. So we can't quite say the ion traps are, are there just yet, but it's a super interesting kind of uh, area of research and uh, I would keep my eyes uh, open for, for new developments. Now, onto the second kind of, uh, of qubit that uh, a lot of kind of other um, people are, are working on, and this is superconducting qubits. I'll explain what's going on in the slightly odd image um, behind me in a second. Um, but before we can kind of really crack on with, actually, no, I will explain what's going on in the picture. So this is, this is called, uh, this is levitation of a, so this is a magnet above us, or floating above a superconductor. Now that superconductor is called, cooled even, 
um, to a temperature below something that's called its critical temperature. A critical temperature for a superconductor is the temperature below which it will start to actually exhibit these superconducting properties. Up until then, it can be just like a regular material. It can be a semiconductor or it could be an insulator. There's lots of different types of material that this could be. Now, when we, um, when we lower the temperature of, of the superconductor down to below the critical temperature, um, I'd, I'd like to just kind of give a quick 101 on how superconductors work. So we've got this lattice, right? And this, this is a lattice of the nuclei of all of the um, atoms that are making up our superconductor material. And we can kind of imagine the electrons, which I'll, I'll introduce a couple of electrons in a second, but our electrons are kind of in this sea surrounding these, these um, nuclei in this lattice, right? But the main structure is held together by these relatively slow moving and regular um, pattern of, of um, atomic nuclei. And these are positively charged. Everything that's on this screen is positively charged, right? Now, at room temperature, these are jiggling about. You have to use your imaginations. I should have in included an animation, but uh, didn't think of it. Um, but imagine these are all jiggling about really fast. And as we cool them down, they lose this thermal energy and they start to um, jiggle about much, much less quickly. So we can kind of almost imagine them as stationary. They're not, they're still even, even at as low temperature as we can get, they're still moving a little bit, but not a huge amount. Now actually it's this jiggling around normally that causes uh, electronic resistance. It, you can you know, imagine that electron comes in, it's being kind of pushed around by all of these other electrons which are floating around and also these nuclei which are much bigger. Um, and it actually scattering off of those is what causes electrical resistance. Now, the great thing about superconductors is when we uh, cool a superconductor below it, its critical temperature, um, obviously the, the, the atoms or the, the nuclei kind of are much more stationary, as, as we were saying earlier. Um, and let's say that we have an electron here, and this, that's the little white dot there. Um, an electron is negatively charged and the, the surrounding lattice is made of positively charged nuclei. Now, when this electron is in this space, because of the fact that um, it's got the negative and, and it's surrounded by positive charges, and because the positive charges are relatively stationary at this temperature, they're actually attracted a little bit. So they actually get a little bit closer to that electron. And this has the effect of attracting another electron into this space, which is also negatively charged, because it's basically created a, an area of slightly higher positive charge density, like so. Zoop. So we get this pair of electrons forming. And this is where the really cool science happens, because this is known as a Cooper pair. And normally an electron is, is, it behaves like a fermion. It is a fermionic particle. This means that it has half integer spin, spin up or spin down, as you might have heard uh, before. This is what Judy was talking about. Um, with the uh, Majorana particles, which I will go into in a, in a minute as well. Um, but when they're paired like this, um, their spins and their momenta will actually effectively cancel out, giving us what's known as a boson. Now, bosons are really interesting because unlike fermions, bosons are all able to condense down into a single uh, state. And this is called a Bose-Einstein condensate because it's all kind of, it's, it's, you can imagine we've got loads of energy kind of levels and they're all kind of slowly trickling down into this condensate, which is right at the very, very low energy, right? And now when we apply a current across the, the kind of from the left to the, the left to the right, sorry, I'm trying to rotate in my head, uh, the left to the right of this lattice, um, our electrons kind of actually pull one another along. And because the lattice is stationary, we don't see any static or any scattering which is why we can have zero resistance motion like that. And that, that's, that's all a superconductor is. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But how do we go about using this for um, quantum computation? Now, normally when we have a, uh, a material, um, all, uh, or sorry, a, um, yeah, a conductor, um, all of the electrons have their own individual wave functions. And, and, and when you look at it as, as a whole, they kind of average out um, and you know, have, have this, um, not average out, but they, they kind of, they combine almost to give us a kind of uh, an interesting equation, but not something that we can use for quantum computation. Now, when we have this kind of this Bose-Einstein condensate and, and these, these Cooper pairs have formed to actually become a superconductor, 
um, they actually exhibit macro properties. And we can use that in combination with something with something called a Josephson junction, which is basically like sandwiching a really thin slice of insulator between two level, layers of semiconductor. And that's what actually we could use to create our two qubit um, state, or our two, two states for the qubit, the one and the zero, because that creates a, 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 a barrier in the superconduction which will change the properties of that material. So that's pretty cool. Um, but how does it actually, you know, oh, by the way, this is a picture of IBM's very first five qubit um, superconductor, um, superdu superconducting quantum computer. There. Um, but how does that stack up to, uh, to those criteria, which I was talking about earlier? As it turns out, uh, these, these superconducting circuits, as you can kind of guess from this picture, are actually relatively easily manufactured using our current kind of technology for you know, PCB manufacturing, in the same way as the, you know, the chips in our laptops are made almost, obviously with different materials, but you get the point. So they're pretty easy to, to you know, obtain and to create. We're capable of cooling them down, where we're, we're there's a lot of development going on for high temperature superconductors, for example, and you know, so, so we don't need to lower it quite down to like pretty much zero Being Kelvin. Mainly Kelvin, yeah. Yeah, um, you can be a little bit warmer. So I think there's, there's ones that run at liquid nitrogen temperatures, for example. We had a cool demo in, in physics, yeah. and that's what that picture at the beginning was. That would have been about liquid nitrogen for, for Kelvin. Um, that's not liquid nitrogen, sorry, 77, 77 Kelvin, Kelvin is liquid yeah. nitrogen, my bad. Liquid helium is 4 Kelvin. <laughs> um, and we can easily manipulate this using kind of classical methods, you know, uh, literally just circuit methods. So we apply currents and voltages and potentials and things like that, and that is what we use to manipulate our qubits. Unfortunately, again, stability is the kicker. It's really, really hard to keep these states in their kind of quantum states for long enough for us to actually do that computation, which is a real pity because this is a kind of you know pretty promising area of research, and you know they're making you know huge huge leaps in the technology, but we're not quite there yet. So keep your eyes uh, peeled for for new developments there as well. Now, the last one that I would like to talk about is surprise, surprise, Microsoft's um, <laughs> approach. So Julie has already covered this off, um, but I'd like to cover it off from a slightly different angle. Um, so Julie explained what a Majorana um, particle was, the Majorana fermion, um, how we get this, uh, this kind of mathematical trick of shifting where our definition of the electron actually is, um, so that we end up with these two almost kind of, you can kind of think of them as half electrons at each end of, of this wire, which we're able to interact with without messing up the nice quantum state in the middle. And how we do this is actually kind of as this, um, this diagram is explaining, uh, we get a superconducting nanowire and we cool that right, right down to about point, or sorry, 15 millikelvin, which is what uh, Julie was saying earlier. Yeah. Um, and at that temperature, the electrons start to behave like these Majorana fermions that she described. Now, what we do then is we can start to move the end. So say we, this is our nanowire kind of going from bottom to top or top to bottom, whatever you want. Um, and we get lots of these fermions up in, in kind of, uh, in pairs. And we start to move, because we can move the ends independently of one another, we can start to braid these um, Majorana particles, which is really cool. So what we're actually doing is our quantum operations are encoded as, diff as manipulations of this braid. Um, and because we're actually in representing our information in this manner, instead of, um, you know, in the individual kind of quantum states of, of the individual electrons, this is much more robust to um, perturbation from our environment um, than the kind of, um, than a lot of other kind of classical uh, qubit, not classical in terms of quantum, but you get my, you know, the kind of more traditional qubit um, architectures, right? Because um, as you can see on, on the kind of right-hand side of the screen, you know, if, if, we, if we jiggle that about a bit and introduce some... Um, Noise. You know, introduce some noise. That's the state of that braid doesn't really change that much, which you know is like almost if you tied a knot in some string and then kind of wave the string about, the knot doesn't change. So we can, using this technology, we're able to produce qubits which are much, much more tolerant to error um, than the kind of the other more traditional approaches. 
Now, this is all incredibly new science, right? It's really exciting. But as, as, as Julie mentioned, you know, this is only kind of observed an experiment for the first time, really, back in 2012, which is uh, you know, not that long ago. We're only in 2018. In terms of science, that's a pretty short span of time. So, you know, it, it, it's super new science. Um, we're making huge leaps. There was a paper released back in March, which much better evidence um, and a kind of closer correlation to theory. Um, the, the predictions of the kind of peaks in the, that they were expecting. So if you're interested in that, that's up on Nature, or you can also uh, go check it out on the archive for free, which is pretty cool. Um, There's a blog as well, right? Um, yes, there is. Yes, actually, there was. There is a blog on the Microsoft Quantum official blog yeah. site, and another one which we will be shortly writing, um, basically summarizing all of the different architectures that I've kind of spoken about here, and maybe a couple of extra if I'm feeling... Uh, generous or enthusiastic, <laughs> I guess, on the day. Um, so keep your eyes kind of uh, open for, for that. Does that make sense? It makes sense yeah. now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, look out for those. They'll be coming uh, soon. Um, awesome. So thank you very much for, for watching. I hope you kind of enjoyed that. And I hope it, it kind of gave you a little bit of insight into you know, the kinds of physical systems that people are actually looking at. And you know, how you know, kind of makes this a bit more real for you, how, how we actually create these two, um, you know, the, these dual states, the zero mm. and one, but using actual physical systems. Hopefully mm. that's uh, yeah. kind of sparked your interest. I learned a lot. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so if you've got any questions for Anita or for myself, um, we'll be taking a 10 minute break now, but send us some questions through Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and we'll be doing a Q&A later and we'll pick those up and get some answers for you. Yeah. So. And we'll be back in 10 minutes. Uh, so see you soon. Thank you. Do you know what a qubit is? So a qubit is a quantum qubit. So it's a kind of like a quantum bit where it can be both one and zero at the same time, or just one and zero like a classical bit would be. Can you explain quantum computing in less than 30 seconds? Yeah, so quantum computing uses qubits to uh, do calculations uh, in computations uh, as opposed to binary uh, bits, which the classical computer would use quantum computers use uh, quantum bits these strange things that can be in multiple states at once that can also do parallel calculations so something that would take a classical computer a billion years could be done on a computer uh, quantum computer in about a second so. what would you do with a quantum computer oh, I'd start by breaking a blockchain or two but then do some um, you know some of the horrible computational problems uh, the global warming one I do find interesting. Um, uh, tectonic simulation for, um, oh, what do they even call it? You know, ge geological instabilities and things like that. Uh, probably some social political problems as well, but uh, you know, things of that nature. I would apply it first. I think we've talked a lot about the optimization problems. Uh, and, and there's some tremendous progress that can be done in uh, machine learning algorithm. Uh, that we are currently using? That's a great question. Uh, probably, um, I was going to say mine bitcoins, but that's a bit shallow. So um, maybe I'll try to solve cancer or, um, yeah, it's very good for optimization problems. So uh, transportation would be good. Um, perhaps energy, trying to optimize uh, uh, batteries, for example, new energy supplies, uh, climate change. You could perhaps optimize and find, come up with solutions for climate change. Um, yeah, healthcare is another great uh, use case. So yeah, any any of the great outstanding problems, basically, I'm I'm actually an optimist that quantum computing can actually help to solve these uh, in in a quite a short time uh, once they come online. How far do you think we are from actually having quantum computers? I'm very confident that we're about five years away. That's variable, as they say. So hopefully within five years, because that would be really nice for studying it. Just ready for going into exactly. uni. Incredible. Schrodinger's cat, dead or alive? Both. Uh, both. Both, neither, and Schrodinger shouldn't be putting cats in boxes to see whether they die or not. And if he had done it, by now the cat would be dead unless it was the oldest cat alive. Uh, nothing but dust. What will quantum computers help us do in the future? Hopefully everything from what they were talking about earlier about um, the 
working out the different um, the properties of particles and optimization problems and machine learning, it could really change the world as we know it. I'd like them to solve um, cancer and healthcare and maybe even aging, like longevity, if we could solve aging and the aging process, because after all, you know, it's a cellular process. So I think quantum computer may be able to help us there. Also genomics. Orbital trajectories are a bit bread and butter these days, but uh, certainly planning for deep space missions and things of that nature, uh, dealing with some of the big data we're getting back from uh, deep space observation, and then, yeah, uh, like large model simulation where the number of variables is just, you know, way outside what a traditional computer can handle. You know, even climate change could be massively impacted uh, through carbon capture, right? We just, we, we talked about it a lot. Uh, all the optimization problems that are pervasive uh, across the industry, uh, and a lot of very, very, very particular uh, machine learning problems can be will be able to be solved when today they cannot with uh, the, the current uh, uh, computing available. What's the worst abuse of quantum mechanics in a movie? The worst abuse. Oh God! Yeah, so many. Uh, maybe Back to the Future, where they kind of go back in time, but it's not really quantum. But um, yeah, any science fiction movie. Um, yeah, some are more accurate than others. I'd have to point the finger at things like uh, Stargate and Star Trek because um, a little bit unlikely. Oh, there's so many because they all do it wrong. Um, I, although I love the Star Trek films, all of their teleportation without discussing any of the ethical implications such as, is it really you after they take your molecules apart and stick them back together again? Despite, especially including the fact that you can't really do that. That's probably a big one for me. talk about quantum computing, it's a completely different game. Quantum computing will enable us to solve problems that currently take longer than the lifetime of the universe in seconds, hours, or days. We completely reconceive the space in which we do computation. Quantum computing is like going from crawling to going to a different planet. It's different. It's only natural that we would want to use the world's most powerful device to combat the world's most challenging problems. We could attack global warming. Security. What are the boundaries of machine learning? Fighting diseases. The possibilities of quantum computers are endless. Microsoft has the best and the brightest working on this problem really happening. Progress is very fast, and we're building a quantum computer. What the world wants to know is what happens when we turn the machine on. What problems will be solvable with a computer that computes in a billion parallel universes at the same time?
Hello and welcome back to the final uh, of, of the kind of the final stretch of Tech Days Online for quantum computing today. Um, in this session, we're going to have a little bit more of a discussion around the actual applications of quantum computing. So we've kind of uh, so far we've looked at how you get started with Q Sharp, some of the basics of quantum computing and quantum information theory. Hopefully, whet your appetite for that. Um, we've also kind of done a quick whirlwind tour of quantum teleportation, uh, some look into um, how we actually build these machines, and now we're going to look at how we apply these in the real world, as in, you know, what's actually, what's in it for me, what's in it for, problems, for all of us? Yeah. yeah, what problems can we solve? Um, so we're going to look at this through a number of different perspectives. Uh, the first one is going to be from a kind of developer's perspective. We are kind of developers after mm -hmm. all, so we thought we'd start there. Um, we'll then kind of quickly look at maybe what this means for data science and ML kind of applications. And then uh, the scientist perspective. So in terms of, um, you know, kind of what applications in terms of things like healthcare or science or industry that, you know, could potentially be um, early uses maybe of quantum computers. First things first, though. Um, Hopefully you know the answer to this um, by, the, by this time in, in the presentation, but just in case this is unclear, classical computers are definitely not going anywhere anytime soon. We're not going to be running around with quantum laptops. That would be really cool, but I don't think you want a uh, quantum fridge in your living room. They're not small. So um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> realistically, quantum computation is expensive, right? Um, yes, technically, a classical computer, because of the fact that it's a subset of a quantum one, effectively, it, it's just a quantum computer that can't do the quantum stuff, right? Um, you know, we, we can simulate uh, everything a classical computer could do on a quantum one. So technically, there's no reason, scientifically, why you would want a classical one. However, quantum computers are expensive and difficult to use and kind of, you know, scale up and all these kinds of things. And we have perfectly nice, you know, 16 gig RAM, um, nice, you know, quad core processor machines already at, at our fingertips. So why, why do it if it's not required? You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it for the time being. So we need these classical computers to, to control our qubits, to, to do data pre-processing and post-processing, like, like Francis was doing earlier, you know, to display our results, to store our data. That's not going to be a particularly cheap thing to do on a quantum kind of system. So, you know, classical computers aren't, aren't going to fade into the background. Um, they're very, very useful for us when we're uh, running quantum algorithms. But, you know, that being said, what kinds of things can we do on quantum computers that we couldn't do before when we were using classical ones? So let's have a look. Said we'd start with the developer's perspective. Um, and this is a little bit of the developer's slash hacker's perspective, I guess. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the things that you might have heard about as an application of quantum computing is something called Shor's algorithm, which is the kind of doomsday scenario <laughs> where all of our kind of RSA encryption is suddenly going to go kaput when quantum computers come online and they'll be able to factorize all the, the kind of the keys really quickly. So I'd like to just walk through. Um, Shor's algorithm, how it works. Well, first of all, how classical encryption works, just in case you're, you're not aware. Just at a really high level, we're not going to go super deep into this. Um, and then we'll look through how Shor's algorithm works, as I say. And then we'll have a look at how we can actually mitigate that in a quantum way. So how we can actually use quantum encryption and quantum key distribution to prevent these problems in the future. And also some classical methods that are being developed for the same kind of thing. So. In terms of um, kind of our classical uh, computing, this is in a nutshell how encryption works, right? So we get some large prime numbers, we smudge them together, usually by multiplication and, and kind of some you know hashing and, and, and things like this, um, and we take that number and um, there's a corresponding number that I have, which is called my private key, um, and that is used as as the kind of key to unlock this big larger number to decrypt information. But I send this, uh, the large kind of multiplied prime number, to Frances. Um, she uses that to encrypt her information. And then she sends it back to me. Um, and I can use it then, my, my private key, to decrypt that information and actually read the message, right? And you can't in, or decrypt. Uh, so someone listening over, you know, listening to Frances's communications with me wouldn't be able to actually decrypt that with, without my private key. Um, and likewise, they can use my public key all, public key all they want, um, but they're not going to be able to kind of decrypt um, the public key using the public key because mm -hmm. that would 
render it useless. Um, and this is all basically just based on the, um, the pr concept that currently with a classical computer, it's really, really hard to factor large numbers. It's just, it's not something that you can do in a human period of time. Um, as, as Julie kind of mentioned, you know, to, to crack some, an RSA 2048 key, it's going to take hundreds of thousands yeah, of years with the, you know, with the classical um, computers, even the best ones that we have, uh, you know, today. Obviously, with kind of brute force attempt, you know, there, there are probably other more efficient ways, but still, they're not, you know, it, it's, it's not an attractable, it, it is an intractable problem, even, mm. <laughs> um, on, a, on a classical computer. Unfortunately, as you might imagine, this is where quantum computing comes in and makes uh, life a little bit more difficult. Now, this is where Shor's algorithm um, kind of comes in. So I'm going to quickly walk you, well, not quickly, we're going to walk through Shor's algorithm um, in hopefully a way that's relatively easy to understand. But um, if, uh, if this kind of goes way over your head, I'll be writing a blog on it. So hopefully that will... Uh, kind of make it a bit clearer in the future. But basically, uh, everything that you see in a square box or a, a little diamond box um, on this slide is going to be a classical operation. And anything you see in a cat-shaped box will be a quantum operation, because I figured, you know, why not go for the mean, right? Mm -hmm. So first things first, we pick a random number, small a, which is smaller than the number that we're looking to factor, which is the big N. You can see the, the things up on the top uh, right of the screen in case you get lost, right? So we picked a random number. Doesn't matter how we picked it. Classical methods will do. Next thing we do. Scary maths time. Um, <laughs> don't worry. Every time, you know, every time I read this, because I'm a gamer, I read global cooldown instead of what it actually is, which is the greatest common denominator. <laughs> um, so the global cooldown, no. The greatest common denominator we, we, we look for is basically the biggest number that we can divide both our guess number A and the actual number that we're looking to factor N by, right? Um, and we look to see if it is one. So basically, if, if it's one, there, you know, there are no other common factors. One is the only factor, you know, great. If we get super lucky and it happens to not equal one, success. We've accidentally stumbled across one of our factors and life is good and we didn't need to do anything quantum. We're just incredibly lucky or incredibly smart. I'm not really sure, but you get the idea. Assuming we're not that lucky, which is usually what happens, uh, this is where quantum comes in, right? So um, we take our, our guess number A, and we use it in this equation. This says A to the power of X. X just goes one, two, three, four, you know, just standard kind of uh, math series. Um, and we do this uh, calculation, A to the power of X, um, in modulo N um, terms. Now, this is kind of, an, an awkward way of basically saying. So if, if you can imagine uh, a clock face, a clock face is modulo 12 addition, right? So once we, we start with, with uh, one, two, three, four, five, when we get to 12, we reset back to one. So that's what modulo um, kind of mathematics is. If you're a programmer, it's the percentage operator. So you just get the remainder minus, you know, however many times the number you're looking for fit into that number. I'm not sure if that was a very clear explanation, <laughs> sorry. Um, but basically what we do is we use our quantum computer to find the period of, of this function. Now the period of a function is really simply just, um, it's the x value at which point um, it repeats itself. So if you think of like a sine wave, right? So we've got up and down and up and down. It starts at zero and um, it takes 3.14 units of x pi before it reaches zero again. So it kind of does this full loop. And that is the period of the sine function. Um, likewise, we will be able to find a period um, of this function. And that will, we will call r, little r. Now, the reason we do this in a quantum computer is because we can use interference, constructive and destructive, um, and the kind of other properties of, class of quantum mechanics um, on our quantum system to find this period much, much more quickly and efficiently than you would normally be able to do on a classical system. So next thing we do is we check if R is odd. If it is, unfortunately, you've got to start again. If it isn't, we move on to the next step. 
Um, we do this little calculation. So does a to the power of our period over 2, so if our period was 4, it would be a squared, um, equal our actual number that we're looking for, minus 1. If it does, again, we have to start again because we're, we're unlucky. If it doesn't, however, we've actually found some factors. So if we do the uh, greatest common denominator again um, of, plus, of, of that equation, so basically a to the um, r over 2 plus or minus 1, we've actually found these factors, which is pretty cool. So, so that's kind of how Shor's algorithm works at a really high level. I'm sorry if, we, if you got lost there, but uh, hopefully you've got at least the idea, right? So we can do this much more quickly than we can on a classical machine. How do we actually mitigate against this? So this is where quantum encryption comes in and quantum key distribution. Actually, there are classical methods called uh, post-quantum cryptography, which are also being developed. But there's a lot of papers written by, by Microsoft, for example. You can see them on our, our, our website. There's a lot of publications. If you're interested, um, head over to the, uh, the microsoft.com slash quantum, and you'll be able to see all of those under publication. But Let's, uh, let's, let's investigate what quantum key distribution is. So how can we actually use quantum technology to encrypt our messages? So here we have Francis and myself. And we have been tasked with the prestigious honor of planning our CEO, Sachin Adela's birthday party, right? And this is a secret party. Um, so it has to be, you know, he can't know about it. So we've decided that we're going to use quantum encryption to, uh, you know, to make sure that everything is totally top secret because only the best for our CEO, right? So what we do is we're going to share a key. Now Francis is going to send me that key um, and then I'm going to use it to encrypt information. Now what we do is because we need to be able to send quantum states to one another, we're going to use photons, as light particles, because we can use that, use either, you know, shooting light through free space, like a, a torch shoots light through free space, or we can use fiber optic cables, like your internet, hopefully. <laughs> um, and photons have this, uh, this property called polarization. Now, what we, what we do here is we, we, we take kind of different types of polarization and, and we use them to encode our information. But to avoid getting bogged down in wave mechanics, we're just going to pretend that our photons have two modes. There is spotty and stripy mode, and there is blue and white mode and we can send photons in either of those modes. Now, these modes are completely, um, completely separate, mathematically, physically, um, and this in physics would be known as orthogonal. Basically, it just means that if I measure in blue or white mode a photon that's actually in spotty or stripy mode, uh, spotty and stripy mode, sorry, I won't get any, inf I can't get any information out. So it'll just randomly show spots or stripes, right? And vice versa, if I measure a photon that's in blue-white mode, in spotty stripy mode, I'll just get a random blue or white photon. So, beforehand, what Francis and I do is we agree on a code. So we say, um, you know, our, our, our spotty one is a zero, our stripy one is a one, and the blue is zero, and the white one is a one. And this is how we actually, you know, kind of encode our key. So, what Francis does is she starts to send me the key. So she sends this string. So she picks, each time she sends a, a, a bit, um, she picks a random uh, basis or a mode um, to send it in. So you can see she's on spotty, blue, blah, 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 blah. You get the idea. Now, she doesn't tell me what basis she's sending in, what mode. What I do on my end is I measure in a random mode because I don't know, you know, so 50-50, whatever. And this is what I get out at the other end. So because my mode doesn't always match her mode, because I'm doing it randomly, um, sometimes I just get a random answer out. Now, here comes the clever bit. So I then phone up Francis. Um, it doesn't have to be a secure line. Um, and we have this phone conversation. And Francis just tells me what, um, sorry, I tell Francis what um, modes matched. And we use that to basically cancel out all the ones where I measured in the wrong mode. And then we can replace those with our encoding for that information, like we agreed earlier. Great. But oh no, Satya has got wind of our, of our diabolical plan, plan. To, to design this birthday party in secret. And now he wants to know what's going on. So he listens in on our communication. 
Unfortunately for him, there's not actually a whole lot he can do. So as Julie mentioned earlier, you can't clone quantum states. So he can't just take a copy of our key being sent um, because that breaks quantum mechanics. So he has to do exactly the same thing as I'm doing, which is to measure randomly in either of the modes and see what he gets out. Now, because that will affect the state of the qubits that we're sending as the key, when we actually do our comparison, and I know that, you know, and, and we, we do this distillation down to only the, the ones that actually um, matched, um, if some of the, if I know that I've measured in the same basis as Francis, and, but I have a, a value that doesn't match what Francis has, I know, so we, we, we basically exchange a random subset of the actual code just to, to double check if we've been listened in on. Um, and you know, if, if any of those don't match, then we know someone's been listening in. And we can just say, you know what, we, we're, these are obviously not secure lines of communication. We're going to switch to a, a different fiber optic cable where you know, Satya isn't... Um, going to find out about his birthday party. Yeah, so, you know, so we can keep this, um, this birthday party completely secret. Um, yeah. And with that, I'll hand over back to Francis again. So I'm now going to speak about Grover's search. And if you're thinking classically, this is about searching a database. So if we, if we look at that here, we've got an example of the search terms that we might have, the terms that we might have in our database. And if I wanted to find one of these terms, at best, I might look and get to that first term. And at worst, I might have to look through all of those items in the list and find that last one. So on average, it's going to take me n over 2 um, searches to find the term I'm looking for. And so that's linear time, so it's got an order of n. Now, in 1996, Grover proposed a method which would use quantum to search a database like this. So we have the same thing, however, instead, we have this order of root n, and this is a quadratic speed, which is, is great. And then a lot of the quantum algorithms that we see generally have an exponential speed up. So this, is, this isn't as good as those, but it's the best method currently known for searching a database like this, an unordered and unsorted database. And to do this with Grover's algorithm, it's using this interference, so constructive and destructive interference that Anita was talking about earlier. And what we're doing is we've got this term that we're trying to find. And what we want to do is increase the amplitude of that term and try and dampen the ones, the other, other terms that we're not interested in finding. So then when we measure those, um, those terms, the one we're looking for, because of the probability of measurement, it's, it's more likely to be that state. Now again, it's probabilistic, so it's not always going to, we're not always going to find it um, on the first try, so we might have to do this multiple times. Yeah, and then very quickly you'll converge upon the, the correct uh, answer that you're looking for, so. And then we also come to machine learning. So uh, Judy spoke about this a little bit earlier, and the thing with machine learning, in classical machine learning, we're looking for patterns in data, and these are subtle patterns so that they're hard to find. And the, we started doing this with artificial neural networks in, in the 50s using, and this is based on like biological systems. Then we built upon those with deep learning. So these are multi-layer multi networks. So things like Boltzmann machines in the 60s through to the 90s. And the thing with classical machine learning is that we can recognize these patterns, and then we can build on that. We can also create data that has that same pattern. So as an example, if you think of like visual data, you might be able to recognize um, a cat, say, and then be able to generate this artificial image of a cat because of how we've um, processed that data and what, what we know the features to be. So with quantum machine learning, we know that quantum mechanics produces these patterns in our data that classical computation doesn't have, classical machines don't have. So the hope is that we can get to a point where we can recognize these, these bits of data and we can use that to um, get speed ups uh, above what we've seen with classical computing today. So how we, how we measure machine learning algorithms classically um, 
it, it's hard to compare at least to quantum algorithms because we have things like query complexity, the gate complexity, how many, how many gates are involved with a, a quantum algorithm might not always map directly to what we've seen with, with classical. So they're, they're hard to compare. Usually we do it numerically. We'll just try it out and see, see what the problem results in. And we can see that with, with quantum machine learning, it's, it's best suited to these, I'm not sure actually how do you say it, BLAS, um, or BLAS, I don't know. Someone correct me if you know. Quantum basic lin linear algebra subroutines. So that's Fourier transforms, finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and solving linear equations. And these are compute problems. They're mathematical problems that we can speed up using quantum. You're not going to be using quantum, at the moment at least, to, to be speeding up things with data. And these map quite nicely to problems like these. I'm not going to list all of them to you now. But if you would like to, there's, um, I've linked a paper below about quantum machine learning. So have a read of that. And it goes into more detail about where these can be applied in, in machine learning scenarios. Really quickly, because uh, we're running. Um, OK, not really quickly then. <laughs> good. Um, so we just really quickly like to. <laughs> really slowly. <laughs> what are the other? We're in a quantum state of simultaneously uh -huh. being really quick and really slow. Um, <laughs> no, I just quickly like to, oh, for the love of, anyway. We're covering off some of the applications that we're going to see uh, for quantum computing in, in the sciences and, and what this really kind of means for, for kind of humanity, right? So we've discussed encryption, which is obviously, you know, something that's pretty important for us, particularly as technologists, but everyone else, you know, you want to keep your credit cards and your passwords and your social security numbers or whatever else it is safe. Um, we discussed kind of machine learning, which obviously touches on all sorts of facets of life. Um, Julie then spoke about um, nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen fixation is, is, is a process that, you know, she mentioned the Haber-Bosch process, which, which uses incredible temperature and pressure to produce this ammonia for fertilization. Now, that actually currently uses 4%, I think, of the global energy production of the world every single year. And that, that's kind of a terrifying number, right? You know, if, if we can use quantum computers to simulate these, uh, you know, these nitrogenase um, molecules with, with enough fidelity that we can actually, you know, mass produce this and, and be able to, to produce uh, fertilizer at room temperature, you know, imagine what the consequences are for, for things like global warming. You know, it could really make a, a, a real impact on, 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 on the world. And there's also examples such as drug synthesis and drug manufacture and design. At the minute, it's pretty hit and miss. Basically, what you do is you, you get a bunch of candidate molecules, which are generally kind of modified from molecules that, um, have, you know, quantum chemists have known about before. Um, and they produce a bunch of variations, and then they just test them. They, they, try, they simulate as much as they can. But obviously, the simulation on a classical system has limits. Um, and then they just they go ahead and test it. They see if it's actually active against the kinds of compounds that they're looking to target. And that's how the kind of, you know, you, you then, you know, animals and human trials eventually. And, and hopefully, you have a drug that maybe could be the next cure for cancer or Alzheimer's or, you know, any of these kind of problems. With the addition of a quantum computer that can actually much more accurately simulate and predict how these molecules will actually interact with other quantum systems we can massively accelerate the development of, of, of kind of drugs and, 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 and things like this. So these are actually some of the, probably the earliest um, examples of, of kind of useful scenarios that quantum computers will be applied to. And it was really, really cool stuff. And um, if you're interested in, in any of these things um, in more depth, um, there are, for example, for the shores kind of side of things, I didn't show it in code, but um, basically what I stepped through earlier, you can go into the quantum GitHub samples repo. Um, and there you'll find Shor's algorithm, for example, um, with a lovely kind of, it's really well annotated. Each line of code is kind of like, this is what's happening. This is where we're finding the uh, greatest common denominator, all of that kind of a thing. Um, so that's, that's up there. There's the some simulation. With, yeah, same with Grover's. That's there, commented. Yeah. And, and, and simulation of things like the hydrogen, the Hamiltonian for a hydrogen molecule and, and things like that. So um, absolutely do go over there and, and have a play for yourself. They're all ready to go. So hopefully we have kind of uh, illuminated a little bit uh, for you some of the actual uses. You know, what, what's in it for you? What's in it for us as, as humanity as well a little bit? That sounds a bit grand, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, please, thank you very much for, for watching. Um, we're going to go 
right over there to the uh, sofas to answer some questions with Christina, uh, some of the questions that you've asked. Um, and whilst we walk, we'll be just showing a quick one minute film of the last few days of London Tech Week. Thank you very much. We're back. So I'm now chatting with um, uh, Anita and Francis. 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. It has been a long week. I apologize. It no, Anita been. and Francis, who've just done um, an amazing couple of hours of content sessions talking about you know, Q-sharp fundamentals and getting your hands dirty with Q-sharp and, and building quantum computing. And so we've got some questions um, from, uh, from the viewers that have come in. And some of them are, when will we be able to have quantum computers of our own in the future? When do you think that's actually going to be a possibility and not just kind of these simulated you know, rentals and, and whatnot, but when do you think it's actually going to, going to be a possibility? So it's going to be, you know, this is obviously, you know, not, don't quote me on this. Of course. But, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're seeing the, you know, the kind of the advances that are being made are, you know, huge. They're, they're accelerating pretty rapidly. Um, you know, maybe in the next five to ten years, we'll see kind of you know commercial quantum computers actually kind of out there uh, in the world, which is pretty pretty cool place to yeah. be. So we're at this really interesting point where we can be designing quantum algorithms and optimizing them based on you know kind of using simulators and things like that, um, and and kind of preparing almost for for this kind of quantum quantum revolution. And, and as, as Julie mentioned, we can actually use insights gained by doing this simulation and this development of the algorithms um, using simulators uh, to feed back into our classical methods and actually you know massively you know see massive improvements on as she said you know doing things 4000 times faster than they could uh, before on a classical computer but without actually using any quantum hardware so we're kind of in this interesting middle position where we haven't quite got quantum hardware ready but we're in. We're still able to use quantum insights to actually accelerate our computation, which is. Yeah, and I think Microsoft have come out in the press saying that they think it'll be a year before we've got a one qubit, one working qubit, and then five years before we've got a quantum computer that can do some useful problem on it. So, so sooner than we think. Yeah. If, uh, but some of the some of the larger like like Shaw's that we were speaking about, that's a lot further <laughs> off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. A lot more qubits. Definitely. <laughs> Let's, um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, post-quantum uh, cryptography. Mm -hmm. um, Microsoft is working on that. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, I mean, obviously cryptography, I think, is, is hugely important as, as we talk more about like privacy and security and, and whatnot. What are some of the challenges that are involved with that right now? So at the minute, um, so cause as we were talking about earlier, um, you know, the large majority of current cryptography methods rely on this kind of factorization problem, right? right. Being really difficult and, and kind of taking just stupid amounts of time on a classical computer. So with the advent of you know, quantum computers with enough qubits to actually factorize this mm -hmm. quickly, we're in interesting territory. So post-quantum cryptography is all about developing classical methods which aren't dependent on these kind of, you know, the, these vulnerable, as it were, kind mm. of, um, you know, factorization, um, security. Yeah. As it were. And, and preparing people so that they have those available to them before the time comes that s someone might have a quantum computer that can crack. Uh, right, because that's what I was going to get at, right? Because that becomes, obviously, that's the scary part is yeah. that we're talking about, you know, being a year away from a qubit and maybe five years away from doing some of these problems and already, you know, cryptography is being cracked and people are already coming up with, with hardware devices to, you know, bold attack, you know, certain phones and things like that. So you could imagine that with even more power, then that could 
yeah. be problematic. You don't know who the threat's coming from. Right. You just need to make sure you're protected against it. But I guess on the same um, hand, so, so obviously creating these new methods going forward, but I guess on the, on the, the same end, um, it's got to be really difficult to be trying to build these, these new algorithms without having necessarily the, the processing power available. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. Um, and that, that's partially where the quantum simulation kind of work comes in, um, but also partially where, you know, kind of, well, you know, there, there's publications and papers being written by, you know, doctors with way more knowledge about this than I, <laughs> I'll ever gain. But, um, you know, that there is such a kind of hot area of research right now. So, um, yeah, you know, it kind of, I guess it comes down to their ingenuity. But there's also, you know, post-quantum, we can, you know, as we learn, we can use quantum itself as, 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 as a massively secure system for, for cryptography. You know, quantum is, you can use quantum uh, particles to produce properly random numbers in a way that you just can't on a classical machine. You can kind of simulate wrong, uh, random numbers, but you'll never get truly random. But right. because quantum mechanics is so probabilistic in its nature, you can, you know, if, if you take a superposition, you measure it a million times, that's going to produce a truly random number, and, and that's you know also part of the way that we kind of work with cryptography. So quantum pro causes some problems, but also solves a lot of those problems. So it's, it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, and you know, uh, at the end of, of your last session, you were kind of talking about some of the first applications that the quantum computing will look like. What do you think is is the most exciting out of those right now? Mm -hmm. So do you want to go first? Yeah, or? I'd say. Probably machine learning, because I think those will be the ones that are soonest. And mm -hmm. um, in terms of the chemical applications, I think they require more qubits, so we'll see those further along down the line. Yeah. So just in terms of being impatient and saying machine learning things. Um, so that actually brings up a good point, because you were talking you know, about, about the QML stuff, Ed, which is obviously very interesting, but this is now, we have a lot of data scientists and, and AI experts, but they're not necessarily physicists, and they don't necessarily have yeah. the quantum background. So What's going to be necessary to kind of bridge those two worlds? Because already we're now finally at a place where many people are going out there and are learning, getting on board with, with the data in AI, but we're kind of on the precipice as you've been talking you know, all morning on this next new thing. So what's the next step to then, I guess, get people yeah. I think shored up? Some of these things uh, <clears throat> you might end up using, but not they'll be opaque to you. So <clears throat> sorry, you'll, you'll see that it'll be in a library that you're calling, but you won't know that the back end okay. there is something quantum. You'll just know that you've got this speed up over something that might have been classical. So there's, there'll be elements where, uh, like a, a data scientist or a machine learning practitioner, will just go along and use these things without potentially knowing the, what's the speed up behind them. Um, but then there'll also be people that are writing these things, so they'll require the knowledge and understanding there. And we're also seeing this really interesting kind of hybrid software developer slash physicist kind of yeah. role almost kind of come out. And I, I, I guess there'll be in, in the future hybrid machine learning mm -hmm. specialists slash physicists who, you know, who are able to take the machine learning side of things and translate them to the quantum kind of side of things, obviously, and work with physicists to actually implement that physically and, and vice versa, work with machine learning specialists to help them to understand more, you know, what's... Uh, what they need to do to, you know, use that to, to its potential. Going back to, um, you know, building quantum computers for, for a second, you, know, you talked about it, it, it's not that long in the future so we might have some production machines, but do you anticipate that the companies, when they'll get ac gain access to them, that it will be kind of as it is now with the simulations and being cloud-based? Yeah, I mean, it's, let's be honest, it's, it's difficult to create qubits, it's bulky machinery, it's expensive, and it's hard to do it well. So people, you know, corporations, um, foundations, I guess, scientific institutions will probably be able to, you know, ma handle that themselves. But for, for the layman and, and, you know, mm. for people, you know, pretty much everywhere else, it's going to be really hard. So a cloud computing model makes a lot of sense, you know, yeah. with Microsoft, the, yeah. Sorry. For the same reasons that it makes sense for classical computing in terms like redundancy, um, having a specialist knowledge to swap out parts, it's especially true for quantum computing. Like, you're not going to want to have to call a quantum engineer to come and right. replace this thing in your cryogenic control computer, yeah. It's sort of funny because as we kind of approach this next wave, um, certain things mirror, you know, kind of the mainframe and kind of yeah. the early computing wave. And in that era, you know, there were, uh, it was the computer sharing, and which in a lot of ways is kind of the cloud now, but just not distributed. So it's interesting to kind of see the, the, um, the future in some ways maybe look like yeah. what we had before, yeah. which is kind of fun. Um, 
I want to ask you uh, both. I think it's hugely important that there's so much academic things happening, but also so many so much research happening on behalf of companies. Have you noticed any kind of disconnect or, or tension between kind of the corporate kind of visions for for quantum versus kind of the academic uh, pursuits in this? So actually, it's been one of those kind of interesting ones where industry and academia have been working really closely mm -hmm. together. So, for example, um, our quantum, you know, our efforts in, in quantum hardware and all of that, they're mostly based in, you know, kind of in Europe, in Delft and Copenhagen and also in, down in Sydney. But we're actually based, all of our labs are in university sites and we're working really, really closely with, with um, obviously, you know, professors and uh, experimentalists and theorists at all of these institutions to actually come together and produce this hardware. And you'll notice that on any of the publications that, um, that come out, they're all joint publications between universities and, and, and you know, industry partners. And, and likewise, um, you know, with, with other large tech kind of firms. I mean, there's always going to be a little bit of, of friction, right? Because this is the way that traditionally academia and industry work is, is quite different. Right. But um, I think that we're kind of reaching the point where everyone is motivated by similar kind of reasons. Um, and we're, we're kind of, we're, we're coming to this, yeah, this nice balance, I think, where industry is almost driving the academia from that kind of like, you know, we need to build something to sell kind of a thing. And then the academia is also pushing the industry forwards uh, hugely and teaching us a huge amount about where we should be looking. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah, no, because I, I, that was kind of my perception was that it seems like things are going well, but I have to also imagine there has to be at some level, yeah. you know, some sort of tension. But that that that's good. But both parties are so, especially with this, I think more than almost anything else, so important for them to both be involved. Um, so I'm trying to just look through these lists. Uh, this is kind of a funny one. Um, when we talk about like a teleportation in, in Q Sharp, does that mean uh, that we can use it for faster than light communication? No, sadly not. <laughs> For any sci-fi fans out there, no. Bummer, bummer. So, so, so no, no, no quantum leap situation. This no, is not where, quite. Ah, that's no. I mean, that's you, disappointing. You can kind of think of it uh, like you think of, so if, if I had two ping pong balls and I painted one blue and one white and I sent one, but I didn't know which one to, to Francis and I looked and I saw I had the blue one. I know she's got the white one, but they haven't talked, right? So it's, you can kind of think of it in the terms of that. You know, there, There's no actual communication going on. I can do nothing useful until I give her a call and say, Oh, well, you go. Oh, I got this. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So you, the only way you know is just based on your own uh, yeah. observation. Got yeah. it. That, but that's still, but it's, it's still cool that that, that sort of stuff exists. Um, and uh, where would you suggest? When I mean, you talked about, you give a lot of resources. But if somebody's really just kind of wanting to to get started with kind of what is available now, is there one main resource that you would kind of point them to? Uh, I guess Microsoft.com slash quantum. Um, so if you go to the resources, there's bits about the blog. And there's links to the GitHub. The the documentation, like we've learned a load from just the, the quantum concepts written in the documentation, then also the explanation through for the QDK and, and just further resources as well. There's a link there. Excellent. And are there any books that, that either of you would recommend? Any textbooks or anything for people? So the, the kind of famous Bible yeah. for quantum computation people, which is uh, Nielsen and Chuang's Quantum Communi Quantum Computation and Information, yeah. is what it's called. Uh, so that's that's a kind of go-to. Um, covers both the kind of computer science side of things and the um, the kind of more quantum physics stuff from a relatively kind of ground up position. So it, it's a really nice intro to all of this. Um, I don't know if you have any kind of other ones. Mm. That I'd say if people read that and get put off by the level of there it is, like just persevere, try and find other resources to add to it, because it is a really useful reference book. Um, but I think it could put off some beginners maybe. I there's know. also, sorry, um, the, the, there's also this fantastic um, book written by a chap called Terry Rudolph oh, yeah. um, over at Imperial and it's called Q is for Quantum. Yeah, that's um, And that's a really, really cool introduction to quantum mechanics and quantum computing because it, it does it in terms of, there's, there's no maths involved. It's all kind of in terms of balls and, and colored balls and not colored balls and that that's a really approachable introduction. So that's also one to look out for. It's also, I think he's in a series of pot webcasts on that as well, video casts. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but. Are there any communities out there for people uh, getting interested in the stuff that you know of? Any online communities? So there's the London Quantum Computing Meetup, yeah. um, which is online a bit and also kind of, you know, they meet up every month and discuss awesome. kind of different, there's a different speaker each month. And we, I think we've spoken there uh, this week. Um, there was uh, last, a uh, few weeks ago, there was Seth Floyd, yeah. it, um, who talked about uh, quantum, quantum machine learning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's all posted online. So that's kind of online as well. Um, 
I'm not sure yeah. in terms of kind of online community. No, but that sounds great. Yeah. And so, so for, for our London audience, yeah, check out the, 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 the quantum meetup. That sounds yeah. awesome. Um, well, Francis, Anita, thank you both so much for everything you did and all of your, your, uh, your information and um, uh, uh, Microsoft.com slash quantum. There's also docs at Microsoft.com has a lot of that content. Thank you for being here. And thank you everyone uh, watching in the audience at home for watching, asking your questions. Please like and subscribe on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube because you'll be able to see all of this content from Francis and Anita and uh, uh, um, Julie's uh, talk earlier today, as well as all of our content from earlier in the week will be on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Microsoft Developer. So be, for, be sure to check that out. Um, and uh, don't forget to go to docs.microsoft.com to see all the documentation for everything we've been talking about throughout the week. For, uh, for everyone here, I'm Christina Warren, and we will see you next time.